apologies, Aaron. Thank you very much, members and members of the public, and welcome to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council's Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Henry Batchelor, and I'm usually the vice chair of the committee, uh, but given the fact the regular chair, Councillor Halings, is absent today, I'll be sitting in the chair for this meeting. Um, given the fact we now have a vacancy in vice chair, I would like to invite Councillor Peter Fain and ask the committee if uh, they will be accepting of him sitting as, as the vice chair for this particular meeting. Agreed. Thank you very much. Councillor Fain, down you come. <laughs> and uh, whilst we're on chairs and vice chairs, as seems to be part of the course today, I have a conflict on one of the items today, so I have to step down from being the temporary chair. The temporary vice chair will have to step into the chair and we'll need a temporary, temporary vice chair. So with everyone's indulgence, I've asked Councillor Ripith if she would mind sitting in for that one item, which for clarity is item seven, Shepreth. So, Councillor Ripper, uh, sorry, members, is that acceptable to everyone? Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, okay, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, can everyone who is present in the council chamber please note that everything on your desk, including laptops and papers, is likely to be seen by the live broadcast at some point. Uh, the camera follows the microphone when it's switched on. So, councillors and officers are requested to wait a few seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up with your microphone. Uh, if the fire alarm sounds at any point, then please leave the chamber by the door near the top table where we're sitting up here and make your way down the stairs. Please do not use the lift. The safe assembly point is next to the marketing suite, halfway back down the road along the business park. Um, and those who are participating live via the stream, uh, please indicate if you wish to speak via the chat column. Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose other than requesting to speak. Please make sure your device is fully charged and that you switch off your microphone unless you're invited to do so otherwise. Please ensure you've switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. Um, and as requested yesterday by email, please use a headset if available when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. When you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Speak slowly, clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone else. Uh, please note, members, if we need to vote on any item, we should do so via the electronic microphones in front of us. When you f um, only those present in the chamber can vote, so those members participating virtually will not have a vote. Committee members, I will now ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Uh, members, after I call your name, please switch on your mics and give a brief introduction. As I said earlier, my name is Councillor Henry Batchelor. I'm one of the members for Linton, and I'm chairing the meeting today. I now ask the Vice Chair, Councillor Fain, to introduce himself. Morning, Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Thank you very much. And Councillor Bradnam. Microphone troubles? Okay, we'll come back to you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Martin Kahn? <coughs> Councillor Martin Kahn for Eastern and Pinkton and Orchard Park. Thank you very much. Councillor Timmy Hawkins. Morning, Morning. Timmy Hawkins, Cordy Court Ward. Thank, Thank you very much. Councillor Judith Rippers. Good morning, everyone. Councillor Judith Rippeth, representing Milton and Water Beach Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Heather Williams. Good morning. I'm Heather Williams, and I represent the Mordens Ward. I'm hoping for no more technical problems, Chairman. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Richard Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I represent the Whittlesford Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Eileen Wilson. Good morning. Councillor Eileen Wilson, representing Cottenham and Rampton Ward. Thank you very much. And we'll, Councillor Bradnam, we'll try again. Thank you. Good morning. It's Councillor Anna Bradnam, one of the members for Milton and Water Beach Ward. Thank you very much. And so the meeting is court, so we will proceed. We also have uh, some officers in the chamber with us supporting the committee today. We have Mr. Chris Carter. Thank you, Chair. Morning, members. Chris Carter, Delivery Manager for Strategic Site, supporting the committee. Thank you very much. And Mr. Stephen Reid. Uh, 
Calling chair. Into the microphone in front of you. The one with the red light on. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, we're having a few microphone issues. Uh, morning, Chair, morning, members. And Stephen Reid's our, um, our legal officer who will be advising the committee of any legal issues we may need advice on. Um, we also have with us virtually Mr. Ian Senior, who I understand is moving on from supporting the committee soon. Uh, but Ian, you are here today to support our new Democratic Services Officer, Mr. Lawrence Damery Homan. Uh, Ian, as you're on the screen, if you'd like to say hello. Hello, yes, he's in Democratic Services. Thank you, Ian. And that's it, that's it. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, clear and concise, that's what we like. And uh, <laughs> Lawrence, if you're online, if you'd like to switch on your camera, microphone, and a quick introduction. Do we have Lawrence? Yeah. Okay, well, if... We get Lawrence Lewis. Morning. Here he comes. Uh, apologies, Chair. Present and here. Thanks for the welcome. Good. No problem. Good to see you. I'm looking forward to having you on the committee with us. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. So, before we start, members, just a few more housekeeping and then we'll get going. Um, if at any time a member leaves the meeting, would they please make that fact known so it can be recorded in the minutes? Uh, we'll be having regular breaks throughout the day. Um, we'll have to make a decision to depend on where we are on the agenda, but if a natural break comes up, we will be taking one. Um, members, you should have the main agenda pack dated 5th of October and an agenda supplement, which was emailed round only, we do not have a paper copy of that, dated the 8th of October, containing an update for the report uh, on the Shepherd item. So with all the housekeeping out the way, we'll move on with the agenda, starting with item two. Apologies for absence, please, Mr. Senior. Me again. Uh, so I've got three apologies, uh, Councillor Harvey, Councillor Haylinks and Councillor Roberts, and one substitute, which is Councillor Brightman. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. We move on to item three, which are declarations of interests. Members, do you have any declarations of interest for any items of business today? Councillor Heather Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just uh, the usual on the enforcement report, but um, on item number 11, that's um, in relation to a property near um, a property of Councillor Sue Ellington. So it doesn't um, forbid me from taking part, but just declaring that interest. Okay. I suppose we all know, yeah, know Councillor Ellington. I think most of us know Sue, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but no, thank you very much for that. Um, as mentioned earlier, I do have one myself, item 7, Shepworth. Uh, I have a pecuniary interest as my employer has an ongoing business relationship with the applicant, so I will have to withdraw for that one item and then I'll be returning for the following item. Members, if there's no more declarations of interest, we will move forward to item four, uh, minutes of the previous meeting. We don't have any minutes to sign off today, but we will be having the minutes of the last meeting of, from the 29th of September at our next meeting on the 10th of November. So, members, we move into the substantive business today, uh, starting with item five, which is an application in uh, North Stowe, albeit, I think, originally in the parish of Long Stanton. Um, North Stowe phase 2B, land south of Rampton Drift, North Stowe. Uh, the proposal is a reserved matters application for 300 dwellings, including affordable non-provision, non-residential floor space, landscaping, open space and associated infrastructure for access, appearance, landscaping, layout and scale. Uh, the applicant is Keep Moat Homes. We have a raft of key material considerations, which you can see in the agendas. Um, it's not a departure application, and it was brought to the committee because it's been called in by the, I think, newly formed North Stowe Town Council. We have a presenting officer, uh, Andrew Thompson. Mr. Thompson, I'm hoping you're online. I am online, Councillor. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being with us today. Um, Andrew, I'm going to throw it straight over to you to introduce the item, please. Sure, that's no problem. Uh, right, uh, good morning, councillors. Um, hopefully you can see the, um, the slides. Um, as stated, this is the application reserve matters. It's the second uh, parcel on North Stowe phase two. 
um, for 300 dwellings, um, approximately 197 uh, square meters of commercial uh, floor space, landscaping, open space, uh, and associated as set out in associated development as set out in the uh, development description. Um, imaginatively titled phase 2b. Um, so the application site, um, it lo looks currently like a field um, and not much around it other than mountain drift. Uh, this is North Stowe uh, at the top of the um, uh, screen there. That is the secondary college which has now been built uh, or the first phase has been built of it uh, and is open for uh, students. Uh, hopefully they're all there this morning. Um, in the context of uh, phase, oops, sorry. Uh, in context of phase uh, one and two, um, you can see here the there's phase one, which is uh, now has all the residential parcels approved, um, and a number of other kind of reserve matters that are going around. The Western Park is nearing completion, and that is and the application site here is shown in uh, red, and again outlined in red here on the right hand side. Uh, this is the town centre, um, uh, which will be uh, the next uh, element to come forward, and the next residential element is here. Phase 2A uh, sits here, uh, which is uh, um, the main part. As you can see, Councillor, this is a bridging uh, scheme between um, the town centre and uh, the, uh, the western uh, primary road um, with further kind of landmark buildings. So there's no landmark buildings within this proposal. Again, another kind of context uh, to the um, proposals um, and again, uh, how this all fits into the wider master plan. Um, and so at the moment, the site uh, looks like um, uh, a field. Um, there are construction obviously <coughs> going on. Uh, this is an aerial photograph from uh, the design access statement. Um, and you can see here, and that uh, some of the buildings that have been demolished over the course of time uh, that were the old uh, airfield buildings. So this is the proposed site plan. Um, the uh, lands uh, landscape and greenway to the south. Uh, this half, he this uh, element here will then also include elements of a town of a town park, which will then be delivered further by Homes England. Um, a grid pattern, uh, as I say, it's a bridging scheme between um, a number of elements, but it, and it does include uh, elements of the town uh, centre character area in this location. Uh, it, this location, majority of it is within Oakington Barracks character area as defined by the design code. And the southern bit is, uh, in addition to the greenway, is the Muse Quarter. Um, so again, the landscape strategy uh, takes forward all the design code elements uh, and how that uh, will be uh, come forward. Um, it's anticipated that the construction will start in the top uh, top right uh, of the scheme and move forward down to this, and then uh, this this the top left corner, and then in the top right, uh, the bottom right quarter. This is where the construction access will be as well. Uh, so the construction access uh, uh, will come through there. So again, these are being managed by Homes England in terms of the strategic access, and there are separate uh, asset aspects of that. Um, with regard to just uh, again, just to give you an idea of the scale. Andrew, um, sorry to cut you off there. Uh, sorry, we just had a request. Is it possible to use the laser pointer function so we can see your yeah, cursor absolutely. a bit more clearly? Sorry. Absolutely, thank Councillor. No problem. Uh, pointer options, laser pointer. There we go. Sorry. Um, there we go. <laughs> yeah, that's um, better. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Um, again, uh, two story uh, next to Rampton Drift. This is just showing that, as I say, the scale. Uh, two story next to Rampton Drift. This is as per the design code uh, and the parameter plans. Three and four story um, next to uh, within the town centre. And again, a, a central spine of three storey uh, and three storey development um, running through. Um, the greenway and leaps are all again shown there. And as I say, the town park runs off to the south uh, and southeast. 
Uh, in terms of housing mix, you know, again, it's well distributed across the site. Um, we negotiated as part of the um, pre-application the inclusion of three and four bedroom uh, affordable rent properties um, in, into the actual properties. Um, so 60% of this scheme is in effect um, uh, what we call uh, is affordable housing. 20% uh, in accordance with the section 106, 20% is um, is affordable rent, and those are primarily the yellowy colours. Uh, the pinky and red colours are what we call uh, are actually North Stowe starter homes. Those are capped at £250,000 for five years um, and are in effect a discounted market sale. And then the bluey colours are the uh, are the market properties. Um, the distribution of these were agreed with uh, with housing colleagues across uh, the pre-application engagement. Um, in terms of the lifetime homes assessment, it should be noted that obviously lifetime homes has now been replaced by uh, building regulations M42, both in national policy and also in terms of um, um, local plan policy. Um, in, in terms, but obviously lifetime homes was uh, conditioned as part of the um, outline uh, planning permission. Uh, so an, a, an assessment has been carried out. This is a uh, what is uh, that was submitted as part of the design and access statement. To, I note the town council did say that they've only seen uh, this uh, assessment as a typical assessment, but obviously all the floor plans and all the layouts have been uh, provided. Further uh, to that, all the uh, houses are, and flats are all compliant with the national and local space standards as set out, which is part of the uh, principal uh, elements of lifetime homes, making sure there's circulation space and, and appropriate space within the dwellings to adapt uh, to future needs. Um, some images again of the uh, uh, that uh, are of the uh, development. Um, some images are better in quality than others in terms of, of how they've been rendered, but um, in terms of, it's still pretty difficult to do trees and landscaping accurately, but. Uh, you can see here kind of, a cane, kind of a Cambridge style uh, buff brick um, with uh, darker materials also associated with it. Uh, materials are conditioned uh, as part of the, uh, if you agree, the approve the reserve matters uh, and those discussions will uh, will take place. Um, similarly, uh, the construction and environmental management plan, uh, that's yet to be submitted, but is a condition of the outline and so we will uh, uh, have those details uh, being submitted and considered formally. Um, in terms of the highways, again, a lot of those will be looked after by highways uh, and in accordance with the strategic management, uh, the any private roads or uh, other aspects will go to Homes England or uh, a management company uh, uh, to look out who look after the whole of phase two. Uh, in terms of the delivery of the, uh, again, some more images here, and I'll get to this one. In terms of the delivery of the LEAP, um, these are matters that uh, will come through the section 106. So, and I can are detailed within the 106 about specification and, and details. So these are matters that will come again in further detail and the town council will be part of those discussions. Um, but as it's detailed by the um, by the section 106, there's no need for a further plan condition at this time. Um, the renewable energy and sustainable construction I've, I've considered in the report uh, that is and uh, set out for you in terms of that it meets uh, not only national policy but uh, sorry local policy, but also actually exceeds it in many ways uh, with options actually to ex uh, to go further uh, if the uh, purchase of the property uh, wants to add further options. And again, the Greenway is seen as a, a route, obviously, that not only uh, east-west, but also north-south. Uh, and what we're trying to do uh, is ensure that that is that. But this gives a, uh, in terms of uh, the report, there is no commercial shown within the parameter plans. So we've had to consider that one separately. And within the report, I have outlined why we think this is acceptable. It is right next to the town centre. So it would be considered an edge of centre location and actually aids the early delivery of commercial space and healthy living opportunities. 
so we have considered uh, the, the, uh, the cafe and commercial or slash commercial space uh, within the application proposals. This is the Rampton Drift Edge, as you can see, two-story, very traditional homes, um, giving a, a good separation to um, to Rampton Drift to ensure that uh, again those are um, you know, and with gaps between to ensure that that it continues to be a landscaped uh, and well thought out um, um, proposal. Um, and again, the central street, much more formal. Um, you can see here some of the renderings gone on the uh, on on the uh, landscaping, but uh, again, green verges, uh, front gardens, again a very formal uh, central street. And this is demanded by the uh, design code as a a, a formal grid pattern uh, of regularity. So in terms of the principle, um, the key issues, uh, the principle and the relationship to outline plan permission, uh, it's a adequate, appropriate reserve matters uh, submission. It is uh, does form uh, the outline plan permission. Nothing has changed in terms of national or local plan policy that would change the considerations. Um, it does form part of our, um, this scheme would form part of our five year housing land supply. Uh, and does form part of our housing, five year housing land supply. Um, in terms of the consideration of reserve matters as set out in the report, um, the scale, appearance, layouts, and access have been considered acceptable. Um, the relationship to Rampton Drift, uh, we consider uh, again is in, in accordance with all the parameter plans set out. Sustainability and construction, um, again, we've uh, set out in the report why we think that's acceptable. Uh, and a number of the conditions are of the outline plan permission have been satisfied and as I say with the exception obviously of principally the uh, construction environmental management plan which will come in the near future. Um, that's it councillor happy to take any questions. Andrew thank you very much very concise presentation of the application there. Um, councillor Williams I see you did have a question is it for the officer now? We tend to leave those to debate, but if it's quick, we can squeeze one in. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's more because it might require the slideshow. I thought that saves putting that up twice. Okay. Um, it's just wondering if you could show on, on one of the diagrams where sort of any informal green spaces will be some areas of the grassland. Because I see from the photos, we, d we sort of see more um, hard landscaping um, within the site, if there's anywhere that you know of. Thank you. Yes. Yes, councillor, there are three um, three laps within the actual proposals as well. Uh, so there's an informal green space in this location. Uh, there is another lap here and there's a further, um, I've forgotten where the other one is, but obviously there is also green space along the northern boundary with Rampton Drift. Um, and um, as I say, so yes, there are three laps within the proposals and I've forgotten where the third one is off the top of my head. But if we go back on, um, that's, that shows the, the landscaping a little bit better. Again, the, photo, the images are, uh, it's difficult to render uh, 3D uh, um, landscaping still. Um, but yeah, there's sorry, the third lap is within the lead. There we go. Okay, thank you. And I'm sure we can, I'm sure we can, um, I'm sure it's not beyond us to bring the maps up again in the debate if we need to. Thank you very much. Um, with that members, we'll move on to speakers who are going to address the committee on this item. Um, I believe we have Mr. Nigel Jarvis for the applicant. That's right, Chair. Andrew, if you wouldn't mind turning your camera off, and um, Mr. Jarvis, if you wouldn't mind turning yours on. Councillor, do you mind if I run through the speech from a, uh, an IT continuity point in case it breaks up and turn my camera off as soon as I've finished? Is that okay? That's absolutely I don't mind. fine. As, I've long just as, been, can, as long as we can hear you is the important thing. Well, that's what I'm worried about. I'm just nervous that you hear it all and then and then happy to show my face. And if it breaks up then, then I can always turn it off again. OK, if we're having trouble hearing you, I'll let you know. Yeah, please. Thank you. It seems OK so far. Great. OK. And just to remind you, you have three minutes from whenever you start. So whenever you're ready, Mr Jarvis. OK, thanks. Uh, good morning, committee. And thank you, chair and members for this opportunity to speak in support of the application by our client Keepmote Homes. I'd first, likely, uh, first like to commend the officer's report and of course support the recommendation on successfully being chosen as development partner by Homes England in the autumn. Keepmote's key priorities were clear. First, secure good quality pre-application discussions with the council 
ensure thorough engagement and communication with the local community and all the stakeholders, and ultimately submit a high quality scheme and secure approval for it by meeting goals and objectives of the outline planning permission, adopted design code and all of the other approved strategies and details. Our team have worked really hard to achieve these by uh, entering a planning performance agreement, working closely with your officers and key agencies through six months of pre-application, by submitting proposals to the Cambridgeshire Quality Panel and taking on their feedback, by undertaking a public exhibition and collecting community feedback over several weeks, and by involving the local community further through stakeholder briefing sessions, including to North Stowe Community Forum, Longstanton Parish Council, and to Rampton Drift residents. Engagement with officers and technical consultees has continued during the application process. Now, as a consequence, there have been very few concerns raised and almost no objections to this scheme at all, including from any of the 150 plus properties that the council's consulted on this application. We've noted very carefully North State Town Council's initial response and their recent comments, which clarify in principle they are in favour of the proposals. North Stowe Town Council were, of course, not incorporated until May, just as we were submitting the application and meaning they weren't part of the pre-application process that we undertook. North Stowe is a really complex project overall, and many of their points raised are dealt with by the outline permissions, many planning conditions and obligations. Others are not relevant to this particular application, and the remainder, such as on affordable housing or lifetime homes, have misunderstood the proposal slightly. We, we regret North Stowe Town Council felt that we should have made amendments, but as your officers quite rightly concluded, the proposals do meet with the outline framework and all of the parameters that uh, that, that entails. We're proud of these proposals, which embody high quality, sustainable design principles throughout. They include 300 homes on the doorstep of the proposed new town centre, making them highly sustainable and with close access to its many facilities and range of transport choices and of course includes areas of strategic open space as well. They comprise an appropriate mix of housing and will contribute to creating a sustainable mixed community. They promote pedestrian and cyclist movement and well-planned public spaces that realise healthy living objectives and provide excellent opportunities for community building and well-being. They comply with the outline parameters, the approved design code and other important strategies for North Stowe. We hope members will agree and are able to support the officer's recommendation today and endorse the application based on the above qualities. Finally, uh, in closing, we'd just like to thank all those who've contributed to engaging with us during the process up to this point. Thank you, Chair. Mr Jarvis, thank you. Almost spot on three minutes, so well done. Um, if you don't mind hanging on the line for a second in case any members have any questions of clarity for you. Of, members of course. Around. Camera on. No, I think that was all clear and concise, Mr Jarvis. OK, so, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your thank time, you today. Your OK, members, we don't have any members of the town council or local councillors speaking, but you'll see they have submitted comments, both the town council and the two local members, on page six of our reports. Um, members, those are all the public speakers we have, so we're going to move into the debate. So we also have an opportunity now to ask any questions of clarity of the officer as well. And as I said earlier, I'm sure Andrew wouldn't mind bringing up his presentation again, should we need it. So, members, over to you. We'll start with Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wanted to draw our attention to paragraph 39 on page 9, uh, comments from the Old West Drainage Board. It's not clear to me that their concerns have been addressed. Uh, I know <coughs> elsewhere it says... There's no need to worry about this, but I just wanted clarity on this point that the Old West Drainage Board raised. Um, in other words, they say it is therefore vital in the view of the board that the surface water discharge from phase two is rigorously controlled. I just wanted to check what the understanding was about um, this, this concern from the Old West. Okay, thank you. Um, Andrew, is that one for you or...? Yeah, I can, I can answer that. I won't hit it. I noticed Hilary Ellis has just joined and I won't go under the bus uh, just to, with regard to this one. Uh, clear, Andrew. Do you mind holding the mic a bit closer to your mouth? Absolutely. Sorry. Um, uh, in, in, I'll answer this one. Yeah, um, <clears throat> so, Councillor, if you will uh, go up to the planning history and uh, on, on the uh, 
proposals, you will note that condition 18, which is the telemetry um, and um, uh, uh, details. Um, in principle, the surface water drainage strategy uh, has been agreed under a previous uh, discharge condition and the submission has been uh, submitted to discharge uh, parts four and five of the condition. Uh, this is a part of the strategic drainage strategy for uh, Hope by Homes England. Um, this is paragraph 14 of your report, Councillor. Um, and um, in, in terms of that, it, we are satisfied and we are aware that a scheme has been agreed by the Flood Authority, Environment Agency and uh, South Cam's own drainage engineer. Uh, we're just waiting for the details of what has been uh, formally agreed before that has been uh, the details of the what's been agreed by those three bodies uh, before discharging that condition um, in relation to parts four and five, which is the telemetry. So it's under control. Uh, it is a matter that will be uh, dealt, dealt with by Homes England uh, and uh, by the sound, uh, by the looks of things, we are very close to signing off uh, the strategic discharge, which will uh, hopefully mean that um, Cotton or the Old West Drainage Board, um, which has become a pretty standard uh, consultation response. Um, but um, I will say uh, those comments are taken seriously uh, and it is a matter we are uh, well aware of and dealing with. Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I I'd like to point to paragraph five on page two, um, which says the, um, the applicant has not submitted a construction and environmental management plan, but this is a requirement of the Outline Planning Commission prior to the commencement of development. Uh, it's a bit ambiguous. Does this mean that it has been done mm. as part of the Outline Planning Commission or that it hasn't been done? Okay. Andrew, uh, it, yeah, condition 30. So it needs to be submitted before um, keep moat. If you approve the reserve matters, uh, that is one of the uh, condition uh, condition 32. So there's been a strategic uh, site wide. Sorry, not on within your paper, sir, Councillor. Sorry, um, of the out condition 32 of the outline planning permission requires both a site wide construction management plan and each phase to deal with a construction management plan. Um, we haven't had that yet but that will come in prior to the starting of development on site and will be consulted on with Northstow Town Council and the usual uh, aspects. So it's to come for sure if Reserve Matters is approved. Okay, thank you. Uh, just sorry, it's fine. You sure? Okay. Uh, members, oh sorry, Councillor Wilson, is that, did you want to follow up on that? No, that's fine, thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I must admit to being very disappointed that um, North Stow Town Council are not here to speak because this application has come before us because they have called it in. Mm -hmm. And we do always encourage uh, uh, town and parish councils to, when they do have applications that come to us to please present themselves or even a statement. And that hasn't happened in this case. So I would like that to be acknowledged and noted, please. Yep. Because um, I would like to ask them questions, <laughs> and now I can't. Um, looking at the uh, comments that they've made, I mean, I, having read through the, uh, the paperwork, I can see that a lot of those issues have been uh, addressed, but the question to, to them would be, has it been sufficiently addressed to their satisfaction? We don't know. So we can only go by what we have before us today, of course. Um, frankly, I think a good job has been done here and I want to commend uh, the case officer uh, on a very good report and a very good presentation to us this morning. Um, I am happy with what I see in front of me and unless I hear otherwise today, I shall be voting in favour of this. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, Councillor Rippert. Um, Councillor Dr. Tini Hawkins has just really summarised what I wanted to say that I wanted to commend um, the officer and, every, and also for working together with um, the applicant, 
and with local people to you know work towards getting what we've got in front of us today and I think it looks like a very good application. Thank you very much. Members, I have no one else requesting to speak, so am I can I take that as everyone is ready to make a decision on this? Yes. Yep. Yeah? Okay. Well members, I haven't heard anyone speak against this. Can I well actually before I jump into that, um, the recommendation we have is on page forty of our agendas. So the officer has recommended that the planning committee approve the reserve matters subject to the below conditions that are then listed below. Um, members, I haven't heard anyone speak against this. Can I take this by affirmation that everyone's in favour? Yes. Agreed? Well, that is, that is then approved, everyone. Thank you very much. Let's <laughs> carry on that way. Yeah, thank, thank you for your time, uh, Andrew. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, councillors. I think your presentation was longer than the debate on that one, but thank you very much. <laughs> no problem with that at all, councillor. Okay, so we'll move on to our next application, which is on page 47 of our agendas. And this is an application uh, on the land east of Teversham Road in the parish of Fullbourne. It's the, it, the proposal is a approval of matters reserved for appearance, landscaping, layout and scale following an outline planning permission which has been granted. Uh, that was for 110 dwellings with areas of landscaping, public open space and associated infrastructure. Um, the applicant is Castlefield International Limited. Again, members, we have a list of key material considerations in our agendas. Um, it is a departure application and the application is brought before us today because Fullbourne Parish Council requested that the application was determined by the committee. The presenting officer is Mr. Michael Sexton. Michael, I'm hoping you're online with us today. I am. Good morning, Chair. Good morning. Good to see you again. Um, I will pass over to you to introduce the report, please, and then if you wouldn't mind hanging on for any questions of clarity. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. Uh, just before I do the presentation, just a quick update as a point of clarification. Uh, members would have received um, a, uh, individually, I think, some documents from local residents. Um, but we're aware that that has been sent to all members of the committee yesterday. I've also received a copy of those documents this morning. So just to flag that, um, I will move on to my presentation. Chair, if you could confirm that my presentation is displaying in the chamber. It's visible. Excellent. Okay, yes. So this is application 329019RM and it is a Reserve matters application for appearance, landscape, layout and scale following outline plan commission for 110 dwellings uh, with areas of landscaping and public open space. Uh, lands the east of Tevisham Road, Fullbourne. Uh, so this is the site in the context of Fullbourne. It's quite a large site. It's located to the northern edge of the village of Fullbourne. Uh, just as a quick cover um i just realized that the reference number at the top of that uh, is the incorrect outline reference number so please ignore that reference number um it is 0202 of 17 uh, is the reference number but that granted outline permission for 110 dwellings on uh, 26th of october 2017. there's a number of conditions from the outline consent that are very relevant to the reserve matters application that's before members today that's set out in paragraph 62 to 80 of the, of the officer report um, which include the submission of the reserve matters, uh, details that were secured as approved plans um, at outline stage, uh, the requirement for the submission of housing mix, including market and affordable, uh, the reserve matters needing to be in general accordance with the approved illustrative layout, um, some conditions relating to noise um, because of a light industrial estate to the north of the site, and a condition that uh, sets out that the reserve matters would determine the heights of the development. Again, apologies, the reference number is incorrect at the top, um, but this is the parameters plan that was established at outline stage. Uh, it shows three development platforms highlighted in the yellowy orange colour, various areas of landscaping and open space in the various greens. It secures the main point of access from Tevisham Road to the west of the site and an emergency access to the uh, east of the site. 
the sort of hashed areas here and here are the points that define the vehicle routes joining the platforms. There's one route across here, and then there can be up to two routes across this area here. So it's quite a prescriptive parameters plan. Again, outline reference is wrong. This is apologies for the copy and paste. These are the access plans just for reference the worst secured outline stage. So this is the main access from Tevisham Road on the west uh, side of the site. And this is the emergency access that was secured at outline stage on to, on to Cox's Drove on the east uh, with the arrangement such that only emergency vehicles, pedestrians and cyclists should utilise this point of access. Uh, this is the exclusion zone, which was secured at outline stage. Uh, this is the Breckenwood Industrial Estate to the northwest of the site. Um, clearly, it was considered there could be a noise impact on any residential properties and gardens located in this area. Therefore, there's a condition requiring a noise uh, insulation scheme to be provided and approved before any residential elements could be located within this area, as per condition 20 of the outline consent. That was submitted and approved, um, and therefore it is acceptable to have residential properties and gardens within this area, but, um, because there will be noise mitigation and insulation uh, measures put in place to protect the immediate spaces of those properties. Uh, this is the approved outline um, illustrative master plan, which condition six, again, incorrect reference number, um, secures and requires the reserve matters application to be in general accordance with, you can see the, the three development platforms and how the 110 units may be accommodated within the site. Central uh, Meadow Park with the, the leap that needs to be provided and a linear park and various routes for ease of permeability in and around the site. Um, just for context, in terms of the constraints of the site, again, much of this was obviously covered at outline stage, but to the north of the site is the Cambridge Greenbelt and open countryside. The site is outside the development framework boundary, which is indicated by the dashed uh, black line. It is a five year housing land supply site. There is a protected village immunity area to the south of the site, which is the Paul Well area, um, and a local green space, which covers the pump house garden. This is the pump house building um, that falls within the site, but there's no development proposal within there beyond some enhanced landscaping. You also have this pink layer denotes the boundary of Bourbon Conservation Area. So this area to the south of the site is largely within the conservation area. And the blue lines indicate areas of surface water flooding. The site itself is in flood zone one, therefore low risk, but there are, as you can see, areas of surface water flooding identified. Um, just for a brief context of the area, these are just a couple of street views of the, the Tevishan Road Junction with Hinton Road. Um, two stories, the prevailing scale of development in the area and the top image is, is some properties on Cal Lane with the site beyond and that's really just to, to illustrate the prevailing two story scale with single story and ancillary buildings. Views from within the site, it's a, a green and open site with uh, various bits of uh, mature landscaping as you'd expect and these are from the design and access statement um, looking towards properties on Tevisham Road, Breckenwood Industrial Estate to the northwest. Uh, properties on Cow Lane. Um, and again, these are views, I think, to the north and to the west, which, which show the context of a, a fairly open and undeveloped area with, with trees and hedgerows establishing the main boundaries. So on to the reserve matters application. This is the site plan that has been provided. Um, as you can see, you've got the three development platforms here, the connecting route through, and then one connecting route and a turning head. So in compliance with the general provisions of the outline uh, consent. And you can see again, various routes through the site, um, enhancing the permeability and ease of movement through the site for pedestrians and cyclists in particular. Um, you have affordable housing located here, marked by the blue and orange stars, another set here and another set here. It is for 110 dwellings, 77 of those are market properties and 33 are affordable properties, which equates to a 30% provision of affordable housing. The provision for 30% was secured as part of the 106 outline stage. So it is obviously below what local plan policy requires, but the outline consent established a 30% provision based on a viability assessment carried out at the time. So that has been carried forward to the reserve matters. Um, 
In terms of housing mix, as set out in the report, there's a, a wide range of housing types that have been incorporated within the development, and that is to provide uh, a mix in terms of scale and appearance, which we'll come on to, um, and to sort of you know, add variety and interest to the design and the appearance of the site in line with local plan policies and the, the full board village design guide. Uh, it's a mix of one, two, three, four, and five bed properties. In terms of scale, um, the majority of the development, vast majority of the development is of a two storey scale, which is denoted by the, the orange colour with uh, single storey yellow uh, ancillary structures, so garages. Um, there are two elements that are two and a half storey, which are these two central apartment buildings which frame the Meadow Park. I'm sure that's an area which will be subject to debates later on, um, but predominantly it is a two storey development. These are some street scene um, or section views through the site. So the top uh, section is, is taken through village lane character area, which is taken along here. And you can see you've got prevailing two storey and then you do have the two and a half storey element of the apartment building here. Uh, section B is taken running north south through the site, looking across the linear uh, meadow park and um, linear park. And again, you can see the two and a half storey element of this unit here and then another street view um, cutting across the southern, uh, southern boundary of the northern parcel and again you can start to see the slight variations in appearance and, and material finish of properties to add interest and variety um, and again some more section plans so the top one is taken across looking south across the southern parcel uh, ee is taken from the southern boundary of the southern parcel and then F is taken looking from the, the industrial estate towards the site of the apartment, the two storey apartment buildings on the north and the western parcel. Just by way of some examples, and many of these were provided in the plans pack, this is one of the uh, elevations for the one of the apartment block buildings that does have the taller two and a half storey elements, um, which as you say, it's, it's a rising ridge, it steps away into the site, so the mass is taken further away from the southern boundary. This is just an example of one of the, the two storey apartment buildings on the western platform. Um, house type A on the in the village lane character area. Um, house type C. I've just picked a few of these just really to show how the, the design and architectural style varies throughout the site uh, rather than showing you all of the, the house types. Landscaping wise, um, there's going to be a, a lot of landscape enhancement going on to the pump house garden, which I think is a, a positive in all respects and make that more accessible to the, the general public and, and residents. Um, as you can see, there's sort of a general southern bound, uh, southern area of landscaping and northern um, area. Lots of uh, soft landscaping in the front frontage of properties and additional tree planting. You've got the central leap area leading into the meadow park again further areas of, of planting uh, a buffer landscape buffer around the northern boundary of the site and along the eastern boundary as well again with further planting um, and area of landscaping and um, drainage basins along the southern boundary obviously very important to highlight the fallborn village design guide spd which was adopted in january 2020 um, it sets out very much that the, the relationship of the village to the countryside is a defining feature of Forborn and something the community places great value on. The application site is located within the Corwell character area for the design guide defines various character areas within Forborn. Um, the design guide has a section all about integrating larger developments within the village. Um, a lot of that is obviously set out in the report and I'm sure will form part of the debate. There is also specific guidance on the template specific guidance on the Tevisham Road site itself um, in the design guide in figure 46, which highlights some of the key um, issues that need to be considered. Uh, again, a, a green edge out to the countryside, the importance of this view across the poor world natural area, which is not to be used for access and is not used for access to the development. The chalk stream and the wildlife corridor, the importance of that, which you can see running through the centre of the site. Um, which leads us on to a lot of key material considerations and um, compliance with the outline consent as set out in the report where officers are satisfied that the reserve matters is in general accordance with the outline. Housing provision again is as secured at um, outline stage and an appropriate mix of affordable and market housing has been provided at the reserve matters stage. 
open space provision is in line with the provisions of the section 106 agreement um reserve matters as we've, we've touched on there are elements that do certainly comply with the village design guide there are elements which certainly cause areas of debate um, as set out in the report and i'm sure we will be discussing this morning um also satisfied that in terms of local green space and protected village community area to the south of the site that there's no infringement on those policies in terms of biodiversity again i'm sure we will come on to this um just to be clear the site does not provide a measurable net gain in biodiversity um but it's not without its notable biodiversity positives and enhancements which are set out i think in paragraph 202 of the report uh flood risk and drainage uh, again i'm sure we will discuss this at length um, and we do know that that is a particular concern um, from the parish council and local residents and we do have lead local flood authority here today to help answer any technical questions um highway safety residential immunity heritage and other matters again officers are satisfied that the reserve matters um, is acceptable in those respects so i think that is it yes sorry quite a long presentation to accompany quite a long report so happy to take any questions thank you very much michael yeah if you could hold on um councillor payne i believe you had a, a question thank you chair um you referred to the uh, village design guide now adopted um it is suggested that the proposals do not achieve the aims of the full-blown village design guide don't take into account the design guidance in the full blown village guide. Uh, what is your assessment of that? Um, I think yes. the... Sorry, just a second, Michael. I think I've jumped the gun a bit here. I think we should really be Sorry. reserving questions for the debate for the officer, if that's okay, members. Apologies, I forgot the, uh, the process there. Yeah, so, yeah, apologies. So if we could hold the questions off the debate at the moment, please, members, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to speakers now, though. Um, so, do we have a Dr. Elizabeth Solia yeah. with us in the chamber at the back? Thank you, Doctor. If you'd like to come forward to the desk in front of you, uh, you should have. If you press the right-hand button on your microphone, that should enable the speak uh, the microphone. And if you're not aware, you have three minutes to address the committee. At which point, if there's any questions of clarity from committee members, you'll get the opportunity to answer those. Thank you. Thank you. There are seven valid reasons to reject this RMA, all of which would remain valid at any subsequent appeal process. One, despite further unlawful modification of the design following our legal challenge in January 2021, the OPP development platform still not respected as five designated parking spaces lie outside it. Two, CC9 of South Cambridgeshire local plan is still breached as the finished floor level should be 300 millimetres above the levels of roads. They've been assessed against the incorrect figure of 150 by the LLFA, and at least 16 buildings fail even that. Three, CC9 also mandates buildings should be 300 millimetres above flood levels, and at least eight buildings fail that. The developer predicts flooding within this part of the development, so this is an unacceptable flood risk to the development properties. Paragraph 42 of the Planning Officer's report is thus completely incorrect on both these points relating to CC9. Four, Local policies are not respected as discussed. The development conflicts extensively with Fullborn Village Design Guide and the Council's District Design Guide. It is wholly inappropriate to position effectively three-storey urban flats, roughly 20 metres from Porwell, a wetland conservation area, or blocks of urban flats adjacent to open countryside. Five, there's a net loss of biodiversity conflicting with adopted policy and guidance, and there's no compensatory off-scheme details. Six, Multiple unlawful substantial amendments have been made since the October 2019 RMA deadline, changing house positions, building heights, and the slope of part of the development, and adding a 30 by 10 metre basin, yet still failing to solve any of the problems, including flooding. Seven, failure to provide any evidence of imperpetuity, management, ownership, and funding for the surface water and ecological schemes, which was a key reason for rejecting the OPP at the last appeal and remains unfulfilled. Regarding flooding, you're being offered advice by the same LLFA team who said Horse Heath Road Linton was safe from flooding eight weeks before the catastrophic floods. As in Linton, there is sustained data-driven local opposition. As in Linton, the advice you're being offered by the LLFA isn't data-driven in that 
They acknowledge the modeling done is based on inaccurate groundwater levels and may underestimate flood risk, particularly to adjacent properties in Cow Lane. They do not comment on the impact of missing groundwater data, including emission of one high reading borehole from the modeling done by the applicant. At no stage in the nine iterations of the drainage plan has it been shown that surrounding properties will not flood. The LLFA is plainly wrong in asserting that sufficient information has been provided to demonstrate that the layout of the site could accommodate a suitable drainage solution. It's a swamp, it can't. In fact, the current documents from the applicant show a severe flood risk to multiple surrounding houses with water 20 to 30 centimetres above their floor levels. We therefore have no confidence in the LLFA's ability to scrutinise such plans and strongly object to the LLFA's approval of the RMA and the intention to resolve all the obvious concerns during the non-public discharge of conditions stage. Just to remind you, members of the planning committee, under the national planning policy framework, you cannot lawfully approve any application that will increase the flood risk elsewhere. I have sent this information, or my, one of my neighbours has, to members of the committee. You do have this information in your email accounts. Thank you so much for your attention. No problem. Thank you so much. If you wouldn't mind staying seated for a second in case there's any questions from members of the committee, uh, any questions of clarity for the doctor, please. Councillor Bradnam. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Sirio, in your experience of living presumably in Fullbourne, um, can you tell us how many times you have witnessed standing water on those fields? Thank you, that's a very good question. So there is standing water in the field, on the field behind my house. Probably most of the winter, I would say for five or six months of the year, you can find standing water in the field, sometimes to a depth of maybe 10 or 15 centimetres, and at other times to a lower depth, perhaps four or five centimetres. I should say, we are so concerned about this. We've dug a borehole in our own garden, right next to the edge of the development boundary, and we can measure levels which are far nearer the surface than anything the developer has um, told us about. And indeed, the level that we measured was 40 centimetres higher than the development. The developer measured it and used in the modelling in the borehole nearest to our property. So in summary, we have no faith whatsoever in the modelling that's been provided, but it already shows that it will flood our house 20 to 30 centimetres above our floors. Thank you. Thank you. A follow-up, Councillor. Thank you. Um, I should point out, um, I do know the site, although there hasn't been a formal site visit. I, I visited it as a member of this planning committee in 2016-17 when it was first considered. I'm also a modest amateur botanist, and, and I can see that the vegetation on that, those fields is characteristic of a very wet, permanently wet grassland. So I, I just wanted to reassure you I'm very concerned about that. Uh, is, is there a question, Councillor? The ecology officer. No, <laughs> sorry. OK. Well, thank you for that. Um, members, if there's no more questions of clarity, oh, sorry, one more. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for um, your very comprehensive um, statement to us. Um, I do note your concerns, um, but one question I want to ask you is about the biodiversity net gain. Um, I know the report has addressed that. I just wanted to find out what your view is of what, how it's been addressed, because the outline planning permission was granted before the current policy for net gain was adopted. And as it states, it's then, we, we can't retroactively, respectively, apply that to this application because it wasn't required at the time. Is that an answer enough for you? So um, I'm happy to take that. Thank you for that question. Um, in terms of biodiversity, while I would agree with your comments that the requirement for net gain is a recent requirement, the requirement for preventing loss is not. And what we see here is a major negative impact on biodiversity. Just to put it in very simple terms, if you concrete over 80% of a beautiful wild landscape full of orchids, water voles, where you've got bats and many other species, what you find is most of those species die and go away. They don't really live under concrete. And therefore, we know that there's clearly going to be a massive net loss of biodiversity. I should say, in addition, 
that there is a chalk stream, and we know that chalk streams are part of our heritage, they're part of our environment here in Cambridgeshire, and we're very proud of them, and we wish to preserve them, because they have water voles and so forth living in the banks, which are a rare species. So the problem we have with the chalk stream area, they have left a little wildlife corridor, I would grant them that, but it does have a couple of effectively three-story flats kind of bunged into it. It's far too narrow to act as an effective wildlife corridor. And, you know, we, we do see wildlife all the time. My garden's teeming with it. We get, we get monk jacks, water voles, salamanders, all sorts of wonderful things. These things are all going to disappear. And so I would urge members of the committee not to vote this through because it's going to have catastrophic effects on what is essentially a conservation of local wetland and wooded area. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. Through, through yourself, Chair. Um, I was just wondering if you could if clarify a, a couple of points. You mentioned about, in your submission to us, about unlawful substantial amendments. Um, is that since October 19? How many amendments have been, you, I take it you've been consulted on amendments since January? Because when we had the meeting, we were told there wasn't going to be further amendments back in January. So if you could clarify if you've been consulted on those amendments that have come forward since and how many there have been. And the other was, I, I caught what you were saying about perpetuity um, management in perpetuity, not perpetuity. It's very early for me, I'm afraid. Um, but yes, if you could just expand a bit on that through yourself, Chair, that would be great. Thank you. Are those questions clear, Doctor? Yes, thank you very much. So I'll take the, um, the first one about the amendments. As I understand it, there have been two substantial amendments um, since this came to committee and was rapidly withdrawn from it in January 2021 because of the draft High Court legal papers that had been received and also my own submission about the legal risk of flooding um, to SEDC if they approved this. As I understand it, there have been two substantial amendments. So the second of the amendments, I think, was the one that led to um, the consultation. There certainly was a reconsultation because of the scale and scope of the amendment. But the key issues, of course, have always been about amendments to try and take account of the flooding. So I think the um, other than the other reason, of course, for the amendment was that the submission in January was well outside the development platform that had been defined in the outline planning commission. It was completely um, incon inconsistent with that and had been missed by the planning officer then in January. And that was the substance of the High Court legal challenge papers. Um, it now only um, fails to meet the outline planning permission in one area, which is an improvement. Obviously, houses had to be moved substantially more than a metre to bring them within that um, outline planning permission area that had been defined for the houses. We've checked on local authority sites across the country as to what would be defined as a substantial amendment, because obviously that has implications for case law. And we recognise that moving any property more than one metre constitutes a substantial amendment. And many of the properties were moved substantially further than that. The other thing that of course happened was the angle of the development platform for the southern platform was tilted. Because the development was going to flood, the southern platform bearing the houses was tilted so that the water would flow from the north to the south rather than the other way round, which means it flows directly into my property. Um, so we were, we were cons uh, consulted about at least one of these amendments, so I'm a bit confused about which amendment it is because we're on version 9 of one of the plans. Um, but I should say there have been at least two substantial amendments, the second of which added a 30 by 10 metre um, flood basin directly behind my house, separated from my house only by a hedge, which, as you will understand, is not waterproof when the basin overflows. Um, so there have been two substantial amendments, to my knowledge, that we take issue with since the January meeting. And I, um, take your point, um, Councillor Williams, that you were the one who spoke very clearly that there should not be any more committed amendments, and that was the whole point of the deferral, was for the um, planning office to take legal advice about their legal risk and to try and look into the flooding. In terms of taking legal advice, I've no idea whether they've done that, but obviously in terms of the flooding, no further detailed flood modelling has been done since then. We have some back-of-an-envelope calculations from the developer which indicate levels of water 20 to 30 centimetres above my floor levels and no other form of modelling, which is a, it's a real disappointment to us when potentially my house could become uninhabitable, uninsurable, 
and unsaleable as a consequence of this going through. So that's the first point. Your second point was about the, the in-perpetuity management scheme. So as far as we understand, there are no details of any form of um, proper management scheme that's going to go forward and look after both the flood risk mitigation scheme, which is incredibly complicated as um, planned. It's got various culverts, which like those in St. Ives, could easily block and lead to the kind of catastrophic flooding that did occur on Christmas Eve in St. Ives. Um, and furthermore, you need a proper management scheme for biodiversity. I mean, we already know there's a big negative impact here, but by not having any scheme to manage the biodiversity, particularly along that chalk stream, um, there are major problems with not being able to maintain the species that we would wish to have in this um, area, which is slap bang next to the conservation area. So we don't have any evidence that there is a proper in perpetuity management scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Councillor Khan, please. Um, what, um, in terms of the area of the fields uh, that currently, how are they managed? Is the grazing? Are they, are they uh, regularly uh, cut for hay? Um, what is the management? Because obviously that will have an implication upon the ability of the, any future management to maintain uh, the interest for the transplantation, for instance, in the area. Thank you. Um, so at present, the fields are not managed in any particular way, to my knowledge. They are simply wild. Um, and we've got quite a lot of brambles around the edge. There's um, tall grass and various, um, I guess, marsh-type species that you tend to get in very wetland areas, and a number of mature trees. Um, and I suppose I've been in Fulborn four and a half years now, and I haven't seen anybody managing any aspect of the fields presumably because of the uh, fact that they're owned by the developer and they've been trying to get planning permission through. As you know, an application was put in in 2015 or 16 and was rejected and that was upheld as appeal um, on various grounds. So the developer has been trying to get this through since about 2015 and I think nothing much has been done with that land since that period. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor? So it hasn't been grazed at all? Sorry, I didn't catch that. So it hasn't been grazed at all? Um, no, it hasn't been grazed, and I don't know whether it would be too wet to graze. I don't know whether the um, animals would actually get some kind of foot rot from standing in standing water. You don't know whether it was grazed prior to the initial applic application? I'm really sorry, actually. I, don't, I haven't been in the area long enough to know, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's, that's fine. Uh, Councillor Bradham again, please. Thank you for letting me come back, Chair. I just wanted to ask Ms. Syria, what is her, um, does she hear noise from the industrial estate uh, at her house and what is the nature of the noise in that area from that industrial estate? Thank you. Um, I'd have to say in response to that question, I'm obviously, I'm a medical doctor and a university research group leader, so I'm actually not at home during the daytime. Um, so I wouldn't really know whether there's noise from the industrial estate, but it, it's not, I don't think that's a major concern, to be honest. It's a fairly small number of things that go on down there. The only thing I would say is that sometimes there are very bright lights on the industrial estate at night, and I don't know how that would play out with respect to adjacent housing. Thank you very much. Um, members, there's no more questions of clarity. Well, thank you very much for your time today. And we'll move on to our next public speaker, which is Mr. Paul Derry, who's speaking on behalf of the applicants. Mr. Derry, are you with us? We can see you, but can't hear you, I'm afraid. No, still can't hear you, I'm afraid. <laughs> and you disappear from our screens. Okay. So, Mr. Derry, if you can hear me, we'll move on to the next public speaker. And if you're able to, uh, to sort the, the yeah, sound, sorry, out, we'll come back. Oh, here we go. I think that, we've got you. I think if I don't put my thing in my uh, video on. You can hear me by the sound of it for an unknown reason. We can certainly hear you, so I'd leave your video off. That seems to be solving the problem. 
yeah, perfect. So, Mr. Derry, you're speaking on behalf of the applicants, and as with the previous speaker, you have three minutes to address the committee, uh, and whenever you're ready. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, members. Um, members will be aware that um, outline planning permission was granted by this committee for 110 dwellings on the site, establishing the principle of development and the access points into the site. Number of units form part of the council's housing trajectory and contribute towards calculation of the five year housing land supply. This application seeks to gain approval for the outstanding reserve matters, in this case, scale, layout, appearance and landscape. We've worked alongside officers at the council through the pre-app procedure, including two design workshops and a session at the design enabling panel to ensure the detailing within the reserve matters is adequate. Further amendments and meetings with officers took place during the course of the application, further improved the scheme and ensure its acceptability. As specified within the outline parameter application, the layout is based upon development in three specific parcels on the site. The lands surrounding these parcels therefore form the open space areas. This allows a spacious low density development with significant levels of green space within. The application site as includes the pump house garden provides an opportunity to bring this pleasant area back into public use, giving a key benefit to the local community. Case officer report provides a full and robust summary of the application, comments received and the amendments made to ensure an appropriate development is being considered today. I'll now touch on some of these matters raised. So despite the site being within flood zone one, flooding is a key local concern. As a result, the application strictly adheres to the outline parameters approved with all built form being situated in three development parcels. Supporting system proposed follows lengthy discussions with the lead local flood authority and sustainable drainage officer. And, and the reserve matters application demonstrates that the system works with the full details to be provided for the future discharge of condition eight of the outline consent. The application is informed by the aims and policies of Fullbourne Village Design Guide. In terms of building heights, the design guide seeks to avoid three storey properties unless they can be justified. Apartment blocks A and B have been designed with taller elements in order to frame the meadow park, with the rest of the building being two storey. Four two and a half storey properties within the site were reduced to two storeys through the amendment process. The design guide also seeks to retain views northwards from Portwell Water through the site to the surrounding countryside and the application includes green space adjacent to the chalk stream, allowing longer views from Portwell Water. Apartment block B has been designed to reduce its visual impact from this identified view. The application provides a successful balance between the development on the parameter parcels and retaining views through to the wider countryside. The outline consent included a 50 metre noise exclusion area around the Breckenwood Industrial Estate where development would only be allowed within it if it's demonstrated that no noise nuisance would result. Details have been agreed and built form is considered appropriate within that area. So to summarise, the application provides appropriate detailing to allow the approval of the outstanding reserve matters to support the approved outline. And this follows significant pre-application with council officers and discussions through to the dissemination period. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Derry. Uh, members, any questions of clarity for Mr. Derry? Councillor Hawkins, please. Um, thank you, Chair, through you. Good morning, Mr. Derry. Good to see you briefly earlier on again. Um, two things, if I may. You mentioned that the design has gone through the design enabling panel. Can you tell us how many times that occurred and was the final design uh, in, in line with the recommendations of the panel? And number two, considering you've had this going for a while, uh, why don't you have an up-to-date modeling for the drainage scheme? that actually can show that this site can be mitigated. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor Hawkins. So just to take your, your two points separately, um, the, the application went, I have to crane my memory back because it's over two years ago, um, went to a design workshop first and then I think it went to an enabling panel and then went back to a workshop before it was submitted um, and I think the takeaways from that 
um, were all based around location of dwellings, heights um, and design um, from memory over two years ago. Um, we'd incorporated as much as of, of the feedback from that that we could um, to inform the development that was then submitted. Um, the second question um, relating to drainage, I think I think members need to be very aware that this is a reserve matters application. Um, so drainage was all agreed in principle during the outline, and so therefore the, the modelling was undertaken during the outline planning application, which was subsequently approved. Drainage isn't a reserve matters for consideration today, other than um, obviously members will no doubt discuss it in their debate next. However, um, when the scheme was amended to have development outside of the development platforms, it was remodelled, um, but subsequently all the development was put back on the platforms. So we, we are, we do um, line up exactly with the the outline application, which was modelled. Now we, we do need to discharge condition eight um, of the of the outline consent, which is um, providing detailed surface water drainage, um, and we'll do that um, should should this be approved today. Any comeback, council? Uh, thank you for your answers. So what I can gather is this: on the first point of the design, you only went this application. Rather, this proposal went to the design panel just once. So the design panel did not actually see the final version of it. Am I correct? Uh, that's my understanding, yeah. We, we certainly you. only have one. That, thank we, you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Second point is that the issue of drainage, you know very well, is of major concern to residents in the village. So you're telling us that the modeling that was done two years ago is still what is there now, knowing fully well that things have changed. And what that says to me is, as a potential developer, you don't care about the concerns. I think we've, I think we've had the question there. If you wouldn't mind answering, Mr. Derry. Yes, there, is, there was a question, but maybe I'll just leave that to, I'm sorry, I've made my point. I don't think there's any need to answer that, Mr. Derry, thank you. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Through yourself, I'm afraid I might have a little list here. Um, so I'd like to ask about, about a response that was just given to Councillor Hawkins about um, the drainage, and I think that might be more than actually one for officers about, because it's quite clear in our report that a key material consideration is flood risk and drainage. So I want to clarify, is the applicant sort of challenging that? Um, the other thing was about, I'm going to say it correctly, I think this time, the um, perpetuity management. Um, could the applicant chair please say why, why this, is, this is missing? Um, and I think uh, I'll, I'll leave it there and see what the response is, chair. Thank you, Mr Derry. Yeah, I don't think we're challenging the fact that drainage is a, a matter that certainly local people um, have got a, obviously um, uh, an important consideration to them. Um, I think what we're saying is that the matter of drainage was determined through the outline planning application. And so our reserve matters application accords with our outline. I think that's the point I was trying to make. So again, whilst we're aware, that local residents will will be very much um, scrutinising the information. It's also important to note that the information that we have provided goes way beyond what we should be providing to a reserve matters application. Um, we've been providing detailed drawing that would come usually through the construction phase, and the, the reason we've done that I think that demonstrates the point that we're not ignoring it. We've provided information way over what we would normally do for a reserve matter application. Um, and that's been in discussion with the LLFA um, and the Sustainable Drainage Officer too. 
Um, the second point you raised with regard the future maintenance in perpetuity, um, that is as per any scheme, really, insofar as it will be offered to Anglia Water um, for their adoption. If they don't adopt it, it will go into a private management company, which is pretty much the same for anything that you will be considering in this committee, I would imagine. Thank you, Mr. Derry. Did you want to come back? I think it may have just um, increased my list of questions for officers, Chair. Okay. <laughs> no. uh, Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, clearly, a lot of us are concerned about drainage. Uh, and I particularly wanted to have two questions. One is um, the officer mentioned development platforms. And I wanted to understand how much higher than the current ground level are those development platforms going to be at? Uh, there is a second question, but that's on a different... Is this a question for the applicant? It is. Okay. Mr Derry? I may, if allowed, defer you to my colleague. Um, we've got on the call um, James Howard from Canon Consulting Engineers, um, who has been working on this project since the original outline application, the appeal, and then the subsequent resubmission. Can I defer that to him? If he has the information, then please bring him in. Good morning, all. Sorry, I haven't got a, um, a separate microphone. Can everyone hear me OK? Excellent. Um, Right. That was just put forward. Uh, yes, I was just hunting for it. Um, I mean, it will be, it varies throughout the site. Um, but it will be between, sorry, I'm just, yeah, looking at the topo survey. 900 mil, something around that sort of order, up to 900 mil. Depending on where you are in the site, obviously, the, the um, topography varies. Yes, sorry. I'm a little bit informal, I'm afraid. Yes, yeah, so they'll, they'll be in the order of up to 900 mil above. Um, yeah, the number, the important bit's the number. <laughs> sorry, 900 millimetres. 900 millimetres. Is that the highest or the lowest point? Uh, these, that's around the, sort of the highest average. Um, again, depending on detailed design as it as it progresses, it you know might vary, 100, 200 mil, something like that. Okay, so, so I think the answer is up to 900 millimeters. Is the and just for the sake, what's that in Imperial? <laughs> I, I don't, not necessarily a question for the applicant, I think, but. Well, uh, <laughs> It's just under a metre. Exactly. Thank you very yeah. much. Of course. Yes, of course. It's just under a metre. Now, that sounds quite a lot to me. Okay. okay. So just the second question yes, please. is, um, the reason I'm concerned about that is because I'm concerned that anything on a new site or anything on any site, you're not allowed to do anything which increases the risk of flooding for neighbouring properties. So how confident are you that... This will not cause an increased risk of flooding to neighbouring properties. And I still have a second question. Okay. Is that yourself, James, that will be answered? Is that one? Yes, Chair, yes. Uh, yes, I mean, as, as confident as I ever am. Um, so, very confident. There's two things happening. There's um, the central storage area between, so, um, between the two parcels in the east is being di designed to accept the predicted surface water into the site and hold it so it's not released downstream at a faster rate. Um, in combination with this, the southern boundary, so the 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 uh, the boundary with Cal the Cal Lane properties that we're all particularly worried about, we're interested in. Um, will allow flow to continue onto that site and then pass westwards. Um, the addition of the 
basin, which is a, just a sump that sits below the existing ground level, is to accommodate the, I suppose, the, the worst case predicted increase in flood water to the south of the site. Does that make sense? I appreciate that's quite a lot of a... <laughs> housing which is clustered into apartments um, next to the industrial estate and I just which is why I asked the question of the local resident as to whether the industrial estate produced noise this may not be a question for that gentleman um, but I just wanted to understand to what degree um, those apartment blocks are being used to screen uh, uh, it actually says in the um, development uh, in, in the report uh, that these properties effectively could screen the rest of the development from the industrial estate. Now I wanted to know, did that mean visually or in terms of sound? Mm. Okay, so I think the question for either Mr Derry or Mr Howard is how much of the apartment is going to be used as screening and in what capacity? So the, there's a condition on the outline uh, consent which um, Mr Sexton had put on his presentation slides, a, a 50 metre um, zone around the industrial estate. The, the condition on the outline sought us to demonstrate that we needed to provide information to make sure that if any residential development was to be within that area, the future residents of that site would not be affected by noise. Um, and we've done that and that's been signed off by the environmental health officer, hence why there are residential development within that um, within that 50 metre protection zone. Um, so that therefore in itself demonstrates that the buildings are not a noise screen for all the others. Thank you, Thank you. Um, and the other point I wanted to check was Will all those apartments have fully opening windows or is some of the mitigation being achieved by having non-opening windows? The second part of the condition on the outline consent requires us to assess it upon completion. So do noise readings from inside the buildings, basically. Um, so won't know the answer. We know the correct answer to that question until they're built. Um, but yeah, we. Um, I think we're relatively confident that full uh, window openings will be possible. Um, be mechanical ventilation when necessary. Um, Thank you, Mr. Derry. Thank I raised that point because in paragraph thirty-three it says, with suitable mitigation. These buildings provide a shielding effect to the rest of the development whilst providing the residents of these premises with an appropriate level of protection. That sounds to me like these apartments are being used to protect other buildings on the other residents on the site. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Well, we've heard from the applicant anyway in response to your question. Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to ask whether the um, predictions on surface water um, take account of current um, provisions uh, that the LF, LLFA um, use or whether it takes account of potential increase in surface water um, because of climate change. We, we've seen this um, on a couple of other applications that um, the current um, prediction of surface water doesn't take account of potential increases in the okay. future. Well, let's ask Mr Derry. I'm potentially going to defer to James again, sorry. James, back in the spotlight. Back on. I shall leave my camera off if that's OK, um, so I can get closer to the microphone without looming in. Um, yeah, the, uh, the surface water modelling has been run for the 100-year event plus 40% climate change and also the 1,000-year event, which is higher. OK, thank you. Councillor Wilson. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, 
35.4 inches in response to Councillor Bradman's imperial question. Um, there you go. Got to love Google. Um, and the other thing was, I just wondered if there's a railway line very close by, could the applicant just confirm whether that's one that's still in use? And if so, how far away are those affordable apartments from the, the railway line? Mr Derry? Yep, yeah, the railway line is still in use and the noise condition that we have discharged related to that as well as Breckenwood Industrial Estate. Um, the affordable dwellings are not located next to it, it's all private dwellings uh, that are closer to it and I don't have a distance off my top of my head. Um, and typically my plan is not going to load, um, but they must be 20 metres, that's a guess, until maybe the case officer can share a plan um, sure. during sure the debate. Yeah. For, more, for more clarity in the debate. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. yeah, I'll say not, not necessarily just the affordable housing, like the nearest property to the railway line. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, yeah, so I think the question was around the closest property to the railway lines. Yeah, yeah. I, th it, I think it's um, it's about 20 metres, yeah. So there's a tree belt next to the railway, um, and then it comes into our site, and there's a and a, a grass area around the exterior of the buildings and then it's um, the dwellings. So okay, thank you. I think, I, think, I think Michael Sexton, if you're listening, if you could try and find that out for the debate, please, that would be useful. Um, Councillor Bradham, your microphone is still on. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I note in paragraph 239 on page 97 of the printed paper that uh, highways would not seek to adopt the proposed development um, but does not seem uh, it doesn't mean it's not going to be acceptable in highway safety terms so can I ask you directly are you intending to build the roads to highways standards and why wouldn't this roads be adopted by highways, if you can just explain that, please. And yes, they are open to highway standards, um, and I don't know the answer as to why they don't want to adopt it. Okay. Anything further, Jim? That's not good enough. He's the agent. <laughs> if you're telling us it's been built to highway standards, and yet highways isn't going to be adopting it, there's got to be a reason. So I'm asking you again, please. Well, we, 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 we design things for adoption. It's obviously up to the local highways authority if they want to adopt it or not. Um, so it's a, in fairness, it's a question to them rather than I. They will obviously have their reasons for it. And again, it's, it's not an uncommon situation for them not to adopt something, it just becomes a private road. Mm. And Councillor. We... Sorry, if I may, a second question, going back to the flooding. Um, we heard earlier on that the, uh, the flood, um, the calculations were good enough that um, Mr. Derry's colleague, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, is quite confident um, that you know, flooding wasn't going to occur. However, um, and I'm referring here to one of the mapped uh, plans that shows flood levels and highways levels, and the... Um, it's showing here that some of the finished floor levels are less than 150 mil higher than the highways levels, which means there will be potential flooding in those houses. So how can we be sure that your calculations are correct when even your own plans are showing that um, there's breaches and there's potential flooding? Mr. Derry. I'm sorry, I'm going to refer again. Sorry, James. <laughs> um, sorry, could you? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, the, I mean, it might help to explain that the we're obviously not talking about a, a if single. If the councillor asks the question again, maybe that might help. Okay. Thank you. I will. Um, I've got here a um, a diagram. One of your plans, uh, Bravo 411, Papa Lima, SK, uh, Sierra Kilo, dash 320, uh, version P09. On that, you've got finished floor levels 
uh, proposed finish floor levels in orange. You've got uh, road finish levels in green. You've got one in a hundred floor level, uh, flood levels in pink. And you've got one in a thousand flood levels in blue. If you look at the orange, which shows the proposed finished floor levels, those numbers show where the level of the house will be. The green is the footpath, the road in front of the house. Now, according to your calculations, the orange should be at least 150 mil above the green. But in a lot of those, it is not. Which means you are not even proposing to build to the right levels and there's potential flooding going to be happening to those houses. How can that be right? How can you say that you are confident of your calculations? Because that would mean there will be flooding in those houses. So a question around the floods compared to the floor levels there, James. I've just had another look at the plan. I think I understand the area you're talking about. Uh, we're talking about the, the central flood storage area, I think. So the... Um, the 10.44, 10.45 flood level in the central um, sort of storage meadow area. That is essentially a, a flood management basin. So those levels, those flood levels are managed flood levels. We have created those managed flood levels to hold them in a basin. That then spills into the basin to the west de facto basin to the west, where we get these lower levels at the 9.98 and 9.89. That then flows out into the watercourse. So whilst some of the levels are lower than the highest flood level at the whole across the whole site, those flood levels are, are separated um, by roads, banks, the the, uh, the development so there's no way for water to get from the area of higher flooding to the lower levels does that make sense nope but i'll leave it there for now okay thank you um sorry going back to the issue around adoptable highways chris i think you wanted to clarify uh thank you Chair. i was just going to highlight paragraph 238 on page 97 of the printed report which uh includes the comments about the local higher authority stating they would not seek to adopt the proposed development in its current form, commenting that suitable inter-visibility, sorry, inter-vehicle visibility for all accesses serving more than one dwelling should be shown, uh, and various other comments. So just, uh, it was just to direct members to that point in response to that question. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Um, members, I don't think there's any more questions for the applicant, so, sorry, Councillor Khan, I see you waving. Um, you, um, one of the objectors has commented that um, the uh, commented on the fact that the, there was a net loss of biodiversity on the site. Um, um, suggested that you uh, there's needed off-site compensation. I know that it's not possible to insist upon that, but had you cons uh, considered that? Um, because all along the time we've always uh, it's always been an obligation not to reduce the biodiversity. Um. There's no, as far as I'm aware, mechanism. Well, there isn't, but there's no mechanism in the section 106 for us to make a contribution uh, off-site. Um, I don't know if South Cams have a mechanism to allow that to happen. 
because um, it's often tricky. You've got to identify a scheme and then negotiate a, a contribution that would bring you a, a manageable gain. Um, but as I say, because of the outlined application, there's been no requirement for us to do it. There are other applications which were approved at a time when there were different uh, policy applications. For instance, North Stowe, where provision has been made off site. I realize that one cannot insist upon it, but I just wondered uh, whether it had been considered. It might have been appropriate in this circumstance to cons think about it. Okay, of a comment. No, thank you, Councillor. There's no question there. Um, I think that concludes all the questions of clarity for the applicant. So, Mr. Derry and Mr. Howard. We thank you very much for your time and your input today. Um, members, it's now coming up to quarter to 12. We're about halfway through the public speakers. What I'm proposing to do is break for 15 minutes until 12 o'clock, where we'll then uh, return with the parish council and the three local members who wish to speak as well. So we'll, come, we'll be in seats ready to start at midday. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we are now live again, and the meeting has restarted. Um, so we're still in the middle of the public speaking element for the full-born application. I'm now going to invite a member of the Parish Council, uh, Councillor David Smith. Councillor Smith, if you come forward to the microphone, please. And so it should be the button on the right-hand side to get your microphone on. There we go. Yeah. And as with other speakers, you've got three minutes to address the committee, at which point if you could stay seated in case there's any questions of clarity for you. So whenever you're ready, Councillor. I'm ready. Thank you very much so far. It's been very interesting. I'm a parish councillor, chairman of planning for my sins. Just to put through points uh, I'd like to bring up about the agriculture use of that building, uh, that land. I mean, it was uh, occupied or used for um, cows, hence the name Cow Lane. It did get ploughed a few times, but the farmer gave up because there was areas where the the crops just rotted, you get these brown dead areas. The other point I'd like to bring up is at Paul Well, there's a flood drain there that nobody seems to have mentioned. That does about 40% of the village drains. And I hope that the uh, people concerned have taken that into consideration. The other point is uh, the railway line. Nobody's mentioned about decibels. Now, we're talking 20 metres. I don't know anybody's mentioned about the decibel rating of the railway line for making a noise and vibration as well. That hasn't been mentioned either, as far as I know. Uh, another point of concern with the village is Cox's Drove, about this emergency access. I hope it doesn't get used for contractors' access. And the same with Tevisham Road is very important that the contractors build an area on the existing land that they do not block Tevisham Road. They're rather, the residents around there are rather concerned. Another point is the what they call the pump area, which is a pond shown on the drawing. Um, security, is it going to be locked? Because at night time it might not get used for recreational purposes that we understand. Uh, that's my finish. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Councillor. And uh, before we go to questions of clarity, I should have asked you this before you started speaking. Uh, do you have the permission of your parish to represent their views today? Yes, I do. Good. Yes. Thank you very much. Glad you said that. That is my job. <laughs> um, okay, questions of clarity for you, if that's okay, sir. Uh, start with Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, thank you for your very succinct presentation. Um, can you just clarify, you said that there's a flood drain that serves some of the village. Can you explain that, please, near Paul Well? Yes, I can. Um, if you look at that area of Paul Well, it's on the, as you face Paul Well from Cow Lane, it's on the left-hand side, and it discharges into the main chalk stream. Now, with some of the exceptional weather we've been having, it does really flow there, but nobody seems to have mentioned how much volume of water does that add to that development as well? Has anybody surveyed that area? Uh, we can explore that. If <laughs> you could, please. The debate. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Fain, I have you done next. Thank you, Chair. Um, looking at the uh, Parish Council's objection, Fullborn Parish Council objection it refers to the Fullborn Village Design Guide, which I think has been um, approved since uh, the original planning commission. Um, and, it, and it states that the proposals do not achieve the aims of the Fullborn Village Design Guide, don't take into account the design guidance in the guide. Um, but it's not very specific. Uh, I wonder if you could be a little more specific as to how it fails to meet the objects of the design guide. The, the developer claimed that it had been adjusted to take account of that. And to what extent the concern relates to the original uh, approval, um, and to what extent it is a matter of the, the concern about on the reserve matters which we're considering today. 
I'll see if I can answer some of them questions. Um, I, I wasn't really involved on the full plan, but uh, it's referenced mainly to the design of the higher buildings. The um, I know some of them have been reduced, and uh, some of the other properties are not in keeping with properties in Fulham. That's what was the concern of uh, Fulham Plan. Uh, I'm sorry I've been a bit vague on that question. That's fine, thank you very much. Uh, I don't think we have any other questions. Of, sorry, one more, Councillor Heather, Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Clear yourself, because I am very familiar with this, with this particular area. I'm just wondering if I, if I could ask that, um, in relation to the heights and things like that, is it, would you say it's fair to say that there are areas where this design in Fulbourne probably would be in keeping, but not in this particular stretch? Because I, I am aware of there being flat lots and, and other things. Um, would that be a reflect, fair reflection of your comments just then? It, it does. The higher buildings um, do cut out the view from other properties. And the other thing is, why are the affordable houses all seem to be congregated in one area. I mean, I, I believe in uh, diversity of types of dwellings. Um, the Ida Dow, I know we shouldn't mention this, but the Ida Darwin development, they've been a lot more considerate between social housing and the heights of the buildings, where this development seems to they can't blanch with some of the areas. I'm a bit concerned about the social housing being all in one area. That answers your question. Do you want to come back, Councillor? Thank you, Chair. I think that's, that's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think there's any further questions for you, Councillor. So, again, thank you very much for your time and for your comments today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to local members now. And, yeah, members, Councillors Dawson and Williams, we thank you very much for being patient. I'm sure you can appreciate you're not new to this process, so I'm, you know how, uh, how timings can always be a bit up in the air with these planning committees, but thank you very much for holding on. Um, Councillor Daunton, I'm going to come to you first if you're online. Um, yes, I am, um, Chair. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can hear and see you. Thank you, um, and good morning, um, Chair and members. Um, should I start now? I think you're familiar with the process by now. Three minutes whenever you're ready, Councillor. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Fulbourne is fortunate in having a village design guide, a conservation area appraisal and a neighbourhood plan in its final stages. The conservation area appraisal refers to Paulwell, a large wet area adjacent to the development site, being the source of the springs which feed the chalk stream you've heard about. I quote, the open space and extensive tree planting here create a very sylvan character and the glimpsed views of fields beyond emphasize the fen edge quality of this area. With the building of 110 dwellings, there will be a significant detrimental effect on these important attributes. Noting that this council has championed village design guides, it is important that full material consideration is given to them. In the officer's detailed report at paragraph 125, it is acknowledged that there is a conflict between the guidance of the village design guide concerning the existing view northwards through the site to the open countryside beyond and the introduction of development. The officer indicates that conditions four and six of the outline approval make it, quote, inevitable that the existing undeveloped view will be lost. But given that a reserved matters application is for the approval of the details of the site layout, and given that the outline approval was for up to 110 dwellings, the loss of the important setting to Paulwell is not inevitable. The village design guide identifies a wide green link from the back of Paulwell providing an uninterrupted wildlife corridor along and on both sides of the chalk stream. Ignoring this, the applicant has placed two large apartment blocks in this corridor, together with some houses further back. The raising of the leap by 640 millimetres to avoid flooding further impacts the view. 
The urban feel of these blocks is completely incompatible with the rural location, and the blocks are for cramped affordable housing, some close to the industrial um, area, as you've heard. Further, I suggest that the design quality of these and other dwellings does not comply with the presumption of the village design guide that new developments should meet high standards of contemporary architecture, compatible with the character of the village while respecting the immediate surroundings. Approval of the scale and appearance of buildings is one of the material considerations to be determined under reserved matters. The government's house building design guide envisages tree-lined streets as an aspiration, which is reflected in the guidance of the village design guide. However, the applicant scheme on its raised platforms is largely devoid of any significant trees or hedgerows, creating a hard aesthetic contrary to the village character, particularly that of the conservation area. This development does not respect the defining open views, it does not respect the rural character and diverse architecture of the village, and it does not provide the high quality design that this council promotes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, members, any questions of clarity for Councillor Daunton? No, I think that's all clear. No, I think that's everyone. So, Councillor Bradman, were you indicating? No, okay. So thank you very much. We'll um, move on to the second local member, Councillor John Williams. John, are you there? Yes, hello, hello, um, Chair. Yeah, good, good morning, committee. Um, good morning, John. Uh, good morning. So I was going to say, I think you're familiar with the process. Three minutes to address the committee, and then yeah. if you could hold on for any questions of clarity they may have for yourself. Sure, OK. Uh, good morning, committee. This application fails to meet the government's national planning policy framework as adopted in 2012, which applied when the outline permission was granted in 2017. The 2012 NPPF states that council should look for a net improvement in all dimensions of sustainability. This includes the natural and local environment. In my opinion, there is therefore an expectation that reserve matters arising from the 2017 outline permission should deliver a net improvement in biodiversity. Can I remind you that biodiversity net gain is at the heart of this council's green to its core policy, yet, yet here we have an application which doesn't even attempt to achieve any biodiversity gain either on or off site. This council has declared a climate emergency and that's the aim of doubling nature. That the proposed development results in a significant biodiversity loss has been clearly identified by the applicant's landscape and biodiversity management plan in Appendix 4. This biodiversity loss has been confirmed in paragraph 204 of the planning officer's report, adding to the outline consent report, which stated, officers are of the view that the loss of this grassland without appropriate compensation and mitigation would result in substantial harm to ecological interests. No means of offsetting the loss of biodiversity is proposed. The ecology officer says that without a reduction in housing density or increased building heights, no mechanisms are available for further biodiversity gains. However, a reduction in housing density is possible. The outline permission, which was granted on the 9th of August 2017, was up for up to 110 dwellings. These wet meadows, the last remaining Fenland in Fullbourne, are an important carbon sink, help protect the area from flooding, and are a valuable ecological site of biodiversity with enhancement potential. The farmland and the chalk stream, a rare and endangered habitat, according to the Wildlife Trust, could, with proper management, achieve wildlife site status. Ecology. The priority for the site is retention of the semi-improved neutral grassland and its watercourses and wetland habitat. The scheme fails to prioritise these issues and indeed cannot, with a large development on artificially raised ground with complex infrastructure requirements, particularly surface water and flood management. To conclude, the outline permission does not bind the committee to accept a scheme of 110 dwellings. The application fails to satisfy national and local legislation, even that legislation which applied back in 2017, 
regarding biodiversity. It increases the flood, flood risk to neighbouring properties against local and national guidelines, contravenes the Fallbourne Village Design Guide and adversely impacts the conservation area, particularly the important setting of Poor Well and its springs. This application can and should be refused. And can I just add, a lot's been said about the height of the of the dwellings. Don't forget, it's now been confirmed that on average they will be about a metre higher than a normal dwelling. So therefore, you need to take that into account when you're talking about the height of the dwellings. So a dwelling of two and a two point five stories is actually on this scheme a height a, a dwelling of three stories. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Members, do we have any questions of clarity for Councillor John Williams? Uh, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and through you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Williams. Just to kind of um, clarify the last point you were making. Now, the, the actual platform to be built on is 0 0.9 meters above the ordinance datum. And then the height of the building will be on top of that. I think that's what you're trying to say. Standing, yes. Okay. So, 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 a, two, so a building that's 2.5 stories high, uh, normally would on, in this development, because of that platform, be more like three stories high. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillors, no further questions? No? Well, thank you very much, Councillor Williams. Thank you. And the third local member is Councillor Graham Cohn, who has sent in a written statement, which Mr. Chris Carter is going to read out for us now. Thank you, Chair. I'll read this verbatim. The statement says, those of you that have served on the planning committee for a number of years will, I'm afraid, be bored for, from my comments because they are the same as every other time I've spoken on this particular application. I would like to start with the fact that it, it is my view that the, this reserve matters application was only pulled from the agenda in January for the flooding risk to be assessed and legal advice to be sought, not to allow the applicant to make large amendments to the application, having had more than ample time to get their application in order. My biggest concern on this site is still the risk of flooding. It has been, it has been on previous attempts of the reserve matters application and in my view is still a huge problem in the application we have in front of us today. This rushed revision of how water will be dealt with on this site does not fill me with confidence at all that, that surrounding dwellings will be protected. I believe the concerns raised by local members, the parish council, residence groups and individual residents are very valid. I would like to remind the committee of the following points. The reserve matters application does not meet the council's criteria for affordable housing. Nearly all the affordable housing on site is comprised of flats which are not pepper potted across the site as I would expect from an application of this size. There is clearly a social housing area to the new estate and a private market area of this new development. I also think it is very poor that the affordable housing has been, adjacent, has been put adjacent to the industrial area where district and parish councillors have expressed concerns regarding the noise. Given this site will be raised due to the water table, I think two storeys as a maximum should be required across the site. It is noted that some of the properties are still two and a half story dis stories despite amendments. I still believe that the access onto Cox's Drove will be a problem unless more measures are put in place to stop through traffic. I do not believe there is enough information on how this site will be managed in perpetuity. I remain worried that the future for residents on this estate or the local authorities may be burdened with a really difficult site to maintain in the long term. I don't think enough attention to detail has been given to this within the reserve matters application. In summary, as district councillor, I object to this reserve matters application, and it is clear to me that there are still a number of problems about developing this site, probably the biggest of which are the issues surrounding flooding and the water table. It is clear to me also that district councillors, the parish council, local residents and residence groups are all very concerned about what this development will mean for the village of Fullbourne in the way it is currently outlined in the reserve matters application. Thank you, Chris, for that. So members, we've heard from all of the public speakers now, so we'll very shortly be going into the debate. Uh, members, just be reminded, this is also an opportunity to ask questions of the case officer. And um, we also have, as I think Michael Sexton mentioned, we have two members of the League Local Flood Authority with us as well. So 
members. With that, we'll move into the debate now, starting with Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll go through my clarification questions and then digest that before speaking in the debate, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, so, through my list, um, we've heard reference about the adjournment about legal advice. You know, was that obtained because there was some ambiguity over whether that had happened or not? Uh, we've also heard about um, potential, um, the amendments and the potential unlawfulness and what have you. So it'd be good to know our own legal advice on that, please. With the affordable housing as well, um, I just wondered if it's possible to see, see that diagram again, making it very clear. I do find sometimes the colour, it's, we sometimes have it where it's blocked out colours of affordable and not, that which is quite helpful. Don't think we've got that, but still seeing that again would be very beneficial. Um, I'd like some officer advice on relation to drainage, given what the applicant said about you know being reserved matters and everything else. So just some clarification from officers on that, please. Um, and also whether the adoption of roads, um, the reasons that the highways authority, the applicant wasn't able to answer that question, but um, hoping that we have an answer ourselves. And if so, could we hear that? Um, I'd also just ask, and this may be more um, a request for yourself as chair, um, and maybe actually the lead member for planning, as, as she's with us today, that I really wasn't very happy about deferring this at all when it first came out, and I did seek reassurance as to the purpose of deferral. And as we've heard, there have been two substantial amendments, which feels very irregular given given the advice that we know has been emailed out to agents by Mr Kelly and given the time lapse. So I would appreciate if, if members would look into why that has happened in this case. There may be reasonable reasons for it, but it does seem irregular. So I think um, residents and ourselves, you know, have a right to know those reasons and why that's happened. Because um, I, I do remember saying that I agreed only to defer or if it was to give the authority more time. But I was not agreeable if it was to give the applicant more time. They have had more than enough time on this. Sure. And then I'll um, digest that information, Chair, before I give my opinion. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. So, um, probably going to start with the legal advice, please, on the amendments that came in. I'm not sure if either officers or perhaps our legal officer can help us then. I was satisfied that it was within the gift of the applicant to submit amendments. Okay, so we've had some advice by legal officer on that. Um, I think now we're going to come to Michael, if you're still on the line, Michael. I think we have three questions from what I gathered. One, uh, we'd like to see the affordable housing layout again, please, if you could bring that up. Um, yeah. And some clarity around the drainage and the adoption of the road from the highways department. Okay. Um, I've just been annotating plan to hopefully highlight the location of the affordable housing. Um, so this is a very quick markup of the site layout plan. Um, I appreciate Council Williams' point. It might not be that easy for you to see the, the little marks on the screen that denote affordable housing, but there's a, a unit, a, a block of affordable housing in this part of the site, and then a group here and a group here. In respect of clustering um, it's set out in my report but the section 106 agreement does allow for up to 20 affordable units to be cited in a group although no group should be adjoining um, and the council has obviously recently um, taken on its greater cambridge housing strategy which provides updated guidance on the clustering of affordable houses compared to the affordable housing spd um, which was adopted some years ago so as set out in the report um, the the location of the affordable housing is acceptable and in line with the 106 agreement and the new Greater Cambridge Housing Strategy. The application has been subject to extensive consultation with the affordable housing team who are happy with the location, the tenure and the size of the units as set out in the report. But hopefully that plan on screen, Council Williams, gives you clarification on the location. Um, could you remind me of the second question, please, Chair? Um, I've got a question around drainage. So, Council Williams, would you mind repeating that for me? Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, the remaining questions is that we were um, 
told by the applicant that we didn't really need to worry about drainage, but our understanding is that uh, flood risk and drainage are for this application. So if we could just have advice as to whether that, our understanding is correct. Um, it yes. would seem very bizarre if it's not. Um, and the other one was if we had reasons why the highways weren't adopting the road and whether we did get some legal advice ourselves. I had, I had a response in relation to the amendments, but not whether we did get what was referenced in January. Okay. Michael, can you um, pick up the highways and drainage? I can. So in respect of drainage, as set out in paragraph 208 of my report onwards to the end of the drainage section, um, it's my view that, that uh, flood risk and drainage is relevant to the reserve matters application. I think they do fall within the the realms of the definition of, of what layout and landscape constitute, which is set out in paragraph 54 of my report. Um, as I sort of allude to in my report, it's, it's relevant insofar as a reserve matter application needs to provide uh, a, a sufficient level of information to demonstrate that the the layout and landscaping of the site could accommodate a suitable drainage solution. Um, the more, you know, the full details and the technical calculations behind that are reserved by condition eight of the outline consent alongside details of its long term maintenance. So my advice to members is that flood risk and drainage is relevant to the reserve matters application insofar as the reserve matters application needs to demonstrate that a suitable scheme can be accommodated within the landscape and layout arrangements. Uh, in terms of the adoption, um, there is obviously a condition recommended on uh, on the report about future street maintenance. Um, that's there as a, a safeguard. The comments of the local highways authority, um, and perhaps if I share these on the screen, uh, just for clarity. So these, hopefully you can now see the comments of the uh, local highways authority, which start off by saying that they confirm they will not be adopting any part of the development and, and recommend the condition. They do then go on to state that they would want to see suitable inter-vehicle inter visibility displays within the site um, and details of uh, proposed SUD arrangements. Um, so basically they're saying that they would not seek to adopt the proposed development until this additional information they've asked for has been submitted whether that's that's after you know that could, that could come through after the, the reserve matters decision was made and if the highways authority were then satisfied with displays that were shown as part of perhaps a 278 works or whatever the, the relevant section is the highways may well adopt the development if they're satisfied with future information but at this stage on the information available they wouldn't adopt hence the conditions so that gives protection as part of the condition that there would be suitable management arrangements in place and apologies, I've forgotten the other question, but I think it was a legal one, so I may well defer to Stephen Reed. Uh, okay, thank you, Michael. Um, I'll pass over to Chris regarding the deferral that we had of this application in January. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, just in terms of any legal advice taken, that was uh, internal legal review of the uh, draft uh, judicial challenge, which was provided the evening before at the planning committee and obviously referred to as part of the reason for deferring the item at the time. So it was reviewed internally with, with legal officers, officers from 3C Legal and, and planners. Thank you. I think that clears up any ambiguity that residents had about whether that had happened. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Next speaker, we have Councillor Dr. Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, through you, and I will try not to be a grumpy old woman today. So, uh, this site, uh, um, really, uh, we are where we are, but I think it's, um, it's unfortunate that um, it was granted outline planning permission because it is obvious to everyone that it is going to be a problem one. So hopefully for this committee in future, we can think about um, those who will succeed us in committees and how they might be able to um, uh, implement the things that we, um, uh, that we give permission for. Um, I note all the concerns and I thank, uh, you know, the residents, the parish councils, the district councillors for um, uh, expressing the concerns 
um, as they have done. Let me start with the um, uh, affordable housing. I must admit to being surprised that we agreed to 30% affordable at outline. And this has been raised by quite a number of people. But on that score, I'm afraid we are stuck. There's nothing we can do about it now. 30% uh, was what was agreed at that time, and 30% is what the applicant has provided. However, we also um, have a policy where we want our uh, affordable housing to be tenure blind. And I think I've said this before, putting them all in a block of flats or however many blocks of flats does not make them tenure blind. All it does is say, oh, that building, that's where the affordable housing is. It's not tenure blind. Um, one thing that's not been mentioned is the self and custom builders. Of course, we always want on sites like this to have uh, either self builders or custom builders, um, but we don't have that on here. And I think paragraph 92 uh, refers to that, which we would have liked to happen, but we can't because again, there was no requirement for such a provision back at outline stage. Um, 2017, I think, was when this outline was granted. So again, on that, we are stuck. Now, um, in terms of highways, I did ask the question, why wasn't, the, um, <laughs> why wasn't highways wanting to adopt these roads? And now we know. And frankly, the fact that they talked about the um, visibility space and the proposed SUDs, um, you know, details of those being required, shows that they have concerns. And we must take that into account. And the SUDs is also part of the you know, drainage scheme and the flood risk assessment that we have to make today. So please, colleagues, Bear that in mind. Um, I, did, I did ask about the design of the site and um, the design of panel visit. It turns out to be just the one. And I've had a look at the, um, the response of the urban design uh, team, and they also have concerns. And as far as they're concerned, there could be improvements made to this design that we have in front of us. So really, um, there's you know, many more question marks. We're not stuck on that one, so let's do something about it. For me, the big issue is the flood risk and drainage. And as we've heard, we need to assess whether there's sufficient information in front of us today that gives us confidence that whatever scheme comes forward, if we grant this, when it comes to this type of conditions, can be accommodated in this, on this side. And for me, that is a big question mark, because I don't think that it can. Um, we've heard that there's a flood drain that drains part of the site, or part some parts of the village, and there's additional water that potentially has not been taken into account um, in the drainage scheme that we've had. And frankly, I would also like the LLFA uh, officers to please just explain to us why in the world are we deferring additional modeling um, to a later stage when we are having to assess this scheme based on what could be put on the site to drain it properly. We need to see that. We need to be sure that this site, which we know has surface water on it for potentially five to six months of the year, can be sufficiently drained. It sits on chalk streams. If you're going to put suds in, if you're going to put tanks in, you're going to have to dig into those chalk streams to fit those tanks. You're going to destroy the chalk stream. There's a lot that could be done 
by the applicants that they, in my opinion, have not done. I still recall a development in my village which didn't even include, you know, risks like this, where the developer created a drainage plan completely off their own bat, presented it to this planning committee, maybe not this one here, but to the planning committee in this, um, in this council, had that looked at, discussed, before they actually brought the application in. So they knew that when they came in, there was no issue with drainage. That is a considerate developer. Why can't we encourage developers to do that? I'm sorry, but in my view, I, I don't see that this side can be properly drained with what's in front of us. And as things stand, I'm not likely to vote for this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, going back to one of your previous points, we do have the LLFA on the line. I don't know if you'd like to pose your or a question to them at this stage, would you? Okay, uh, well, I think we have Hillary and Harry from the LLFA. I don't know if either one of you could pick up on the question around, uh, around drainage, please. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Afternoon, yes, we can see and hear you. Excellent. Um, so regarding the modeling, um, this was something that we, we have requested in the past. Um, and through extensive discussions with with the LPA uh, and the planning officer, it was it was kind of decided that this is a reserve mass application. It's something that is reserved for the detailed design. Um, <clears throat> so we are going to be requesting it under the the application for condition eight. Is that it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, if you wouldn't mind hanging on the line, I'm sure there'll be further questions for you coming up. No worries. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor? <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I'm not sure if Michael can bring up the, uh, the there was a, there was a diagram he showed us which showed the extent of the flood lines mm -hmm. on the site. Can we see that, please? Michael, is that possible? Because for me, that is a red flag that says if that yeah. is where the resting line is for the flood mm. or surface water, whatever you want to call it, yeah. we have wondering... to be sure it can be mitigated mm. on that side properly without damage to the chalk streams. I think, Michael, we're wondering if you could bring up the flood maps again for us. There you go. So this was one of my slides from my presentation, so I assume this is what... Councillor Hawkins That's is referring to, um, the with the, the blue areas denoting the, the surface water flooding maps from the Environment Agency. The Environment Agency. Mm. Is there a the question, Councillor Hawkins, is there a question relating to this for the officer? There is, is that there's extensive surface water flooding. And so that for me is indication that we need to consider the potential solution to this within this discussion so that we're satisfied that whatever that solution is can be accommodated on that side and will not harm A, the buildings on that side and B, especially the neighbors. And we have heard directly from the neighbours just how bad it can get. Mm -hmm. So I'm not happy with the LLFA's response, is what I'm saying. Because you have a responsibility to the residents. We have a responsibility to our residents, and we have to fulfil that responsibility. I'm sorry, but I'm not happy with what I'm seeing here on this application. Not at all. I'm saying that somebody said, and the other person said, is not good enough. LLFA, you need potentially perhaps even look at your processes and encourage applicants to actually submit reasonable drainage plans. Okay, so I think your concerns have been noted. Can I, can I comment on, on where we are, Chair, in, in terms of the applications for board members? Yeah. So, yes. Obviously, it, I think there is a shift in the general planning process now that, that there needs to be more information up front, but clearly, you know, the, the outline application was granted in 2017. 
based on a, a flood risk assessment and drainage information that was submitted at the time. You then get the process of considering reserve matters, and there's still then the process of the discharge of conditions, which has all the, the technical details. So it's, it's quite a clunky process. I will accept that you know, the principle of development on this site, which would have shown areas of surface water flooding in, in 2017, has been accepted. The information submitted as part of the reserve matters application in consultation with relevant technical consultees does provide enough evidence to give confidence that a scheme could be accommodated. Um, and that's part of the, 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 well, members will have to obviously take it, well, well uh, in time to take their own view on that, but the recommendation within the report is that there is enough information there. You will see that there's several informatives attached to the reserve matters application that do require um, groundwater testing um, and, and, and modeling to be undertaken as part of condition eight. Condition eight is a fairly bland, non-specific drainage condition, um, but there will be a lot of owners on the applicant to provide the, the, you know, the calculations that are fully required, and then they're highlighted on the outline, uh, sorry, on the informatives um, that have been put in as part of this reserve matters uh, recommendation. So acknowledging it is a very sensitive issue, but because it's that three-stage process, that, that's where we are with this one. And it is for members, obviously, to take a view if they feel they're not satisfied that there's sufficient evidence here. That a scheme could be could be delivered. So, okay, thank if that's you. That's any help. I think that is. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on to the next speaker now, which is Councillor Ripper, please. Thank you to everybody who's um, contributed today and for your time, and it's been very interesting and informative. And I am quite aghast, really, at um, the sort of wing and the prayer attitude of the applicant that we can just put put these things in later and I'm not happy with the modelling being up to date enough for the flooding um, risk. I think flooding and drainage is a massive key material consideration on this application. I'm also not happy with the layout of the um, affordable housing. It appears that it's been used to shield um, the rest of the site and also the fact that we they may not be able to open their windows and yet that's something for later. Um, I will not be voting for this application. There are just too many things which um, make it something which is not frankly good enough. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Fain. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think we've all noted some very significant concerns about this uh, reserve matters application. And I think the issue that we have to have regard to is whether those are concerns about the, the reserve matters that we are considering today, or whether those are actually concerns about the principle of development that was determined in 2017. Um, looking specifically at the three issues that particularly concern me. The village designed guide. Um, I didn't actually quite hear what the case officer said on it, but on the other hand, this is set out quite clearly at para 133. Officers do acknowledge there is a degree of conflict um, with certain aspects of the village design guide. Um, however, they consider that the layout has sought to retain the key views along the, ch the, the chalk stream which I think was one of the key issues in the village design guide. Um, then my second area of concern is, of course, biodiversity, uh, the extent to which biodiversity net gain is achievable on this site. Whilst I see that as principally a matter that was considered at the outline stage, I accept what Councillor John Williams said, is that it would be possible to greatly improve the biodiversity within the constraints of that uh, original approval. Um, on the question of flooding, uh, this is obviously one not to be underestimated. Not only is this a particularly sensitive site on the chalk stream, but there is potential here, quite obviously, from the plans that we have seen for significant flooding to neighboring properties if this is not got right. I'm not entirely happy that the local uh, LLFA answered the questions put by Councillor Hawkins earlier on, but 
their assessment, again, is quite clearly set out in the report. Um, I refer in particular to paragraph 214. Um, they refer to the reserve matters application being subject to several rounds of consultation and robust scrutiny. Uh, and the uh, 226 officers in consultation with the LLFA acknowledge there are questions remaining relating to groundwater levels provided by the applicant and the modelling that has been performed. I think that to approve reserve matters with that degree of uncertainty on such an important issue um, would not be acceptable. So I am, on those grounds, inclined to say that despite much of this being matters of principle approved back in 2017, there are sufficient issues outstanding um, to give good grounds for refusing this approval of matters reserved. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Brandon, next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, members, you will have heard some of my views earlier on. Um, interestingly, um, I, was, I believe I was part of that committee, uh, and I was very unhappy that this site was uh, finally approved. Uh, I'm really concerned. I'm just, they, these are in no particular order, but I'm really concerned. I think this is a, a very unpleasant application. For example, um, the whole area is subject to a flood risk. Um, the open space around these one metre platforms uh, is pretty much all uh, sustainable urban, dra urban drainage systems. In other words, that means it's not flat land that children can play on. I appreciate there is green space outside the development, but I feel that for a very large proportion of the time, this area is going to be even wetter than it was before. The areas between these now one metre platforms will be even wetter than they are currently. And when I visited the site, it was a, a reasonable average day and it was squelchy underfoot. Uh, and very wet, particularly in the western field of the two. And there was sedge and rush growing there. That means that's a long-standing presence of water in, that, in those fields. Uh, this is not a, you know, a passing thing that comes and goes. It's always there. Um, I'm not happy about the biodiversity aspects or uh, the scant regard they've given to the um, chalk stream. I would remind members that the poor well is the source of that chalk stream. It's where the chalk, the water, upwells over the clay beneath and provides um, the beginnings of that chalk stream. I note with appreciation that in the application it says that the construction uh, phase should take great care not to pollute that chalk stream, but we're talking right about the headwaters of this stream and there is absolutely no way in a million years this will not change the character of this chalk stream. And in fact, the previous ecology officer at South Kansas District Council made that point when we looked at the site all those years ago. Housing density. On uh, paragraph 31, on page 7, the ecology officer notes, in my view, this is a, a paragraph of despair. It says, given the housing density approved within the outline application, can see no way in which further gains in measurable biodiversity can pro be provided without either a loss of housing density or increased building heights. But as Councillor Daunton pointed out, the outline application permitted up to uh, this number of dwellings. It didn't prescribe that number of dwellings. Nevertheless, um, I think the, the, the attempt very little attempt has been made to improve the biodiversity, which they could have done by reducing the number of dwellings on this site. If they had tried to do that, we might have felt more sympathetic to it. Uh, and also, I am extremely concerned that with those very large platforms, all one metre above the current um, datum, that will inevitably increase the risk of flooding to properties uh, which are neighbouring this site. Um, right, so then 
I'm also really unhappy about the distribution of the affordable housing. As I said uh, when I spoke to the, um, the lady, uh, Dr. Sirio, you know, it seemed to me that these floods, flats are being used to protect the rest of the development from the noise of the industrial estate. Uh, she was unaware of whether there was a great deal of noise, but certainly the environmental officer mentioned noise in their report, and I'm not happy about that. Um, but going back to water, on paragraph 37, I draw your attention to the fact that the Lead Local Flood Authority, at the top of page 59, read, referred to um, the fact that the documents submitted demonstrate that surface water from the proposed development can be managed through the use of tanked permeable paving throughout the private and shared access areas and parking. Blah, blah, blah. Surface water will be shared across basins around the development and created attenuation below permeable paving before discharge from the site at a rate of 0.3 litres per second per hectare. How can you put created or indeed tanked permeable tanks underneath when if we are to believe the resident, the water level is already only 0.4 metres from the datum. So I'm just not happy with that, and I don't think it will work. Um, also, we know, I know, from the ecology officer, that when water sits in crated accommodation, in crates like that, when it finally discharges, it is stagnant, and it does pollute much more uh, than water that has flowed naturally in from elsewhere. The other point that the gentleman from the parish council spoke to is about the railway. Now, I don't know if I'm remembering this incorrectly. It is a while since I've been to the site, but as I recall, the railway is slightly higher than the site, which means that these houses would not only be, what was it, something like 10 or 20 metres from the railway, but the railway is going to be higher as well which means just at bedroom level, you're going to get a lot of noise from the railway. I know that houses do exist quite happily, quite close to railways, but um, it seems unwise to build them so close. And so with all of these concerns and, and the fact that I feel that the, there is a present risk and we have no evidence actually on paper now that this will be properly addressed. As others have said, I think it would have, I would have felt more confident if I had seen a proper drainage scheme in front of us as we give approve, you know, as we were considering whether we wanted to approve this application, I would have felt happier. But since we don't, I'm afraid I can't. Okay. Thank you very much. You covered a lot of points there, Councillor. Um, members, we do have another one, two, three, four speakers. We could try and not cover points that have already been covered if you share those concerns. Uh, that would be appreciated by myself. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I mean, I, I think from start to finish, really, it's, although the flooding issue, others have mentioned that in great detail, and, aren't, and I'm not convinced that it can be fit, fitted into the scheme, especially for the 110 dwellings. But even if you put that to one side and, and left it to condition eight, I think there's still a lot that comes up wanting in this application. And I just wanted to actually read policy H101C on the affordable housing. It says, in small groups or clusters distributed through the site. So no one's saying there can't be small groups. No one's saying there are clusters. But I don't think we've really looked at that distribution. And we, we do need to be consistent. And I recall an application, I think it was in Sawston, where there was some um, of the site was one side of the road and some on the other. And actually, because there wasn't affordable housing on the other side of the road, we saw that as a reason for refusal, because it wasn't distributed through the site. Now, there are clearly three separate areas within this development, and we were shown them very clearly with some inconnectivity. And one of the um, areas, one of the three, has no affordable housing in it whatsoever, very much like the application that we had before. So I'm... I, I do not agree in my assessment that it is distributed through the site. There are three clusters, two in one section, one in another. They could be at least one in each. Um, and also on the design, um, as, I, as I sort of referenced, knowing the area pretty well, there are areas where a two and a half storey building for flats and full one I think probably would fit into the character, thinking maybe with somewhere like Cambridge Road and, and that section. 
but definitely not this area. It's not fitting to the design of this development. It's not fitting at all to Tevisham Road and the, the site that it's in. And I think actually residential amenity, and perhaps we don't speak about this enough, but we're, obviously when we're sat here, we're not just thinking of the current residents, we've got to think of future residents and the residential amenity of the people that will be moving into those houses. And as has been referenced, that's why I asked about the railway station if it was still in, in use. Because I live some miles away from a, a railway line, yet if the wind's in the right direction, we still hear the trains coming through. So being that close, I'm not convinced that there's enough measures in place. And my recollection is that it's slightly higher as well. And therefore, so I'm, I'm not convinced that the residential amenity for the future residents will be, will be something that we would want residents of South Cam to experience, um, nor for the um, current residents. Hopefully not doubled up, Chair, um, but um, I do think that uh, on that alone, even if we took the flooding out, it's, it's a no for me. Okay. Thank you very much. So, members, the concerns I'm hearing so far re revolve around biodiversity loss, the layout of affordable housing, the drainage and flooding modelling, urban design, uh, deviation from village design guide, a general lack of information, uh, housing density and amenity of properties that are close to railways and on the border of the site. Um, members, I'll carry on with the list of speakers, but if there's any new concerns that members would like to raise, those should be the first ones, please. Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. I will be brief because all of the concerns I think have adequately been set out. I was concerned about this application uh, on reading the uh, paper report. Uh, my concerns have not been allayed. All of the points you've uh, laid out, I share, and I shall not be voting for this application. Not be voting to approve. Thank you. Um, Councillor Khan. <coughs> my, my particular concern is biodiversity. I, I take all the points that other people, in particular Councillor Bradman, have said. Uh, uh, but my particular concern is the fact that, uh, th that there is a net biodiversity loss, or, or, or you cannot um, reduce the information by this development, which is, doesn't conform to the existing uh, the, uh, indications for existing, the policy that was existing at the time when the application was approved. Uh, there seemed to be a conflict here. The, as the people commented, the application was up to 110 houses. And it seems to me that, uh, I mean, I think you could have an application which improved biodiversity on the site. But it would have to be, th there is a conflict. You either have to provide compensation off-site or you have to reduce the density. And so there were two alternative ways that that might be uh, achieved. Neither has been achieved. Neither approach has been achieved. Furthermore, there is no clear indication of how the site will be managed. The site, uh, the biodiversity on that site is wet meadows. Uh, the, the particular interest is in the areas along the stream where, the, where the high water, uh, with large areas of water along. If you drain the site, you're going to remove, you're uh, going to reduce the area which is wet and therefore is of interest. If you, uh, if you, um, if you don't graze it, which has, uh, has been indicated it was originally uh, grazed by cows, you don't graze it, you're not going to maintain that interest. You can translocate the plants but if it is not managed right afterwards, they will disappear. Um, there is no indication of how that will be managed. Uh, I don't see, therefore, uh, we can't insist that they provide off-site compensation. We can't insist. It's up to the applicant to come with a satisfactory solution. The solution that has been provided to me does not seem to meet the requirements that we wanted in the, in the policy at the time. And therefore, I cannot see how I can approve this, 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 this application uh, for reserve mass unless a satisfactory scheme is put forward. Thank you, Councillor. And we have one final speaker, Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I share all the other concerns of the other members of the committee. I would just like to add to it that um, I'm very concerned about the fact that uh, in its present form, the application, um, highways would not adopt the roads, and I'm, I'm concerned about the future burden of cost that this would place on um, residents of the local parish council in maintaining those roads, but I share all the other concerns on biodiversity and everything else, and so I can't support this application. Great, thank you. I think our legal officer would like to have some input. Chair, can I just ask Councillor Wilson to repeat that, because Chris Carter didn't hear the initial part about the highways issue. Oh, um, I, I was just saying that I added to all the other concerns I have a concern about the fact that in its present um, form, 
um, the highways are not likely to adopt the roads in, in this development and the extra cost that this could uh, uh, place on future residents or the parish council. Okay, have you heard that, Chris? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Mr. Reid. I think uh, you thought I might want to comment on that. Uh, I'm not sure that I do, but um, yeah, other than to say that the Highway Authority said that at this point in time uh, they wouldn't adopt. It's not that they won't adopt. Um, so I think that's just a point of clarification. If I may go on, Chair. Just yeah, to please. There's all the speakers we've had, so thank you. To address it, so obviously, there's been quite a few reasons for refusal floated, um, and we've been making notes of those. Um, through you, Chair, I'd like to, at the appropriate time, request a short adjournment just to uh, draft those reasons up with the case officer. Um, the reason with regard to design, um, we've heard uh, discussion from members about the issue of uh, the height of the two and a half story buildings. Um, in key views which are identified in the village design guide. It'd be useful to know if there's anything more than that in terms of design that members would cite um, in their objections, um, just so that we can ensure that any reasons are as robust as possible. Okay. Members to assist officers, were there any further concerns regarding the design of the scheme? Just the heights? Sorry. Councillor Williams. I was going to say, it's, it's the height and the sort of dominance of, of flats in that area, which we're saying is, is more suitable in other areas of Fullbourne, but what I was, but not, not in this location. Okay. Councillor Hawkins. Um, thank you, Chair. And um, the, as mentioned in paragraph one to five, there's, as the view, there was a very important view northwards, which the flats will be blocking. It's in conflict with the thing is temp. Yeah, paragraph one, two, yeah. five. Okay, thank you, Chair. And whilst I have the floor, if I may, Chair, we, this village design guide, step back. Fulbon was selected as one of the villages to have the village design guide precisely because it was going to be having a lot of development come through because of the five year land supply um, issues that we had before. So it is important. That their views are taken into account. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Chris, is there anything further you need before we uh, adjourn for a few minutes? No, I think I've got everything. Thanks, Chair. Just a few minutes to draft those reasons would be helpful. How long do you think you need? Uh, well, screw you. Um, members, what do you think about taking a lunch break now? We can come back in, say, half an hour's time. Uh, we can run through the potential reasons for refusal, then have a vote, and then we can move on. Is that acceptable to members? Yes, I think that's the majority. So, okay, we'll break for lunch now. Um, if we have half an hour, so we'll come back at 25 to 2. So that is 1.35 members will restart.
we're restarting the meeting now, please. Um, so we are on agenda item six, land east of Teversham Road, Fullbourne. Um, members, we've concluded the debate now and raised some causes for concern um, that we believe the, or the potential reasons for refusal should we vote that way. Um, Mr. Chris Carter is about to, or maybe perhaps Michael Sexton is going to display um, the reasons uh, as set out in the debate on the screen now. Uh, members, we need to decide whether these are, this covers all of our concerns as a committee. So, Chris, if you wouldn't mind displaying them on the screen. Or an officer would mind displaying them on the screen. Sorry, Chair, my team is just having a bit of a moment. So, Michael, if you don't mind, could you put them on the screen? Uh, yes, happy to. Just reloading them. But you don't need to see me for this, so I'll turn me on. Okay, while they're being put up, uh, yeah, Chris, if you don't mind running through them, please. Certainly, Chair. So the first reason uh, is around design. It's quite a long reason, but obviously there was a lot of discussion around that. So it reads as follows. The proposed development, by virtue of the scale and sizing of the two and a half story apartment buildings, located centrally within the site and within a key view north through the site across Porwell and along the chalk stream towards the open countryside beyond, would result in significant harm to the character and appearance of the area and we would significantly erode the existing wide open view and green space, which provides a positive connection between the existing village and adjacent countryside. Furthermore, the adverse visual impact of the apartment buildings is exacerbated by virtue of the buildings being sited on raised platforms, which would increase ground levels by up to a further 900 millimeters above existing, enhancing the adverse prominence and dominance of the central apartment buildings within site and within key views from the surrounding area, creating a scale of development that is out of keeping with the character of the area. The proposal is therefore contrary to policy HQ1 of the South Cambridgeshire District Local Plan 2018, paragraph 130 of the National Planning Policy Framework 2021, which required developments to be of high quality design, to be compatible with its location in terms of scale and appearance, and to make a positive contribution to its local and wider context, and the Fullbourne Village Design Guide Supplementary Planning Document 2020, in particular, guidance notes 10.3, 10.10, 10.12, and figure 46 of the guide, which seeks in section 10 to integrate larger developments within the village. Thank you. If you could scroll up, Michael. <coughs> Drainage reason. Insufficient information has been submitted to demonstrate that the reserve matter scheme can provide a satisfactory scheme of surface water drainage and prevent the increased risk of flooding. The proposal is therefore contrary to policy CC7, CC8, and CC9 of the South Cambridgeshire Local Plan 2018 and paragraph 167 of the National Planning Policy Framework 2021, which require development proposals to incorporate appropriate sustainable surface water drainage systems and to ensure that flood risk is not increased elsewhere. A reason along biodiversity, the reserve matters scheme fails to provide a measurable net gain in biodiversity. The proposal is therefore contrary to policies HQ slash 1M and NH4 of the South Cambridgeshire Local Plan 2018 and paragraphs 174 and 180 of the National Planning Policy Framework 2021, which require development proposals to aim to, aim to maintain, enhance, restore, or add to biodiversity and minimize the impacts on and providing net gains for biodiversity. And finally, affordable housing. The reserve matter scheme by virtue of the proposed layout fails to adequately distribute affordable properties throughout the site and to integ integrate those units appropriately with the market housing. The proposal is therefore contrary to policy H10 of the South Cambridgeshire Local Plan 2018 and the Greater Cambridge Housing Strategy 2019 to 2030, I presume that is supposed to be, uh, which seeks to provide affordable housing in small groups or clusters distributed through the site. Thank you very much. Sorry, 2023, not 2023. Yeah, sorry, I've just done a live update on screen. It is 2023. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, members, does that capture our concerns uh, that raised in the debate, or is there anything further that members thought uh, was an adequate reason for refusal? Councillor Bradnam, please. Did we have a concern about proximity to the railway? Oh, that's right. There was um, loss of amenity for the houses closest to the railway. Through you, Chair, Michael may wish to comment, but I, I think there is no concern from the environmental health team with regard to noise impacts from railway. Obviously, it being quite intermittent, I think it's a fairly quiet line. 
uh, in any case, but Michael may be able to expand on that further. Michael? Thank you, Chris. Yes, there, um, there were conditions imposed on the outline consent. Uh, condition 19 was a, a, a noise condition related to the railway line that has been discharged um, and, and noise levels found acceptable. So I would be reluctant to encourage members to consider that as grounds for reasons for refusal. Okay. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I thought we had a highways issue with the lack of willingness to adopt. Yes. Uh, Chris, do you want to come back to me? Yeah. So with regard to um, highways, the um, apparent or present unwillingness of the highway authority to adopt uh, the roads is not in officer's opinion a sustainable reason for refusal um, because that position may well change should planning permission be granted at any point in time um, plus the highway authority is not objecting on highway safety grounds um, so simply um, the current position of not adopting is in our view at least not a sustainable reason for refusal okay. thank you councillor ripper um, I don't know if we can see it again on affordable housing. I'm not sure, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but we talked about the block of flats of affordable housing being used as like a shield. Can that be incorporated or is that more to do with just general layout, like a shield from the noise and, mm -hmm. you know, air and pollution for them? So it's probably more general layout to, um, point. Okay. Is that something that could be added? Chris? Through you, Chair. I think that's probably more of a design point if that is a concern for members. Uh, I would add that the... Just for me. The, the, the Environmental Health um, Officer obviously has, has considered the living in, environment that will be created within those buildings um, and found that to be uh, acceptable. But um, I, through you, Chair, if, if members felt they wanted to add something to the design reason for refusal, that might be something we could add and agree the precise wording with yourself and the vice chair. Okay, well, so certainly one of the members has that as a concern. Members, just a quick show of hands. Does anyone else wish to include that as well as a concern? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. So yeah, I think that's most people. So yeah, Chris, I think that's a clear. Okay, chair. So if you're happy, members will um, add some additional wording um, around that issue for the design reason for refusal um, and agree that final wording with the chair and vice chair, if that's acceptable. Indeed, if indeed we do refuse it, exactly. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Khan. <coughs> in terms of biodiversity, um, it doesn't really express the fact that the, 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 the ongoing management of the uh, propose, uh, proposals is not really clar clarified. Uh, and um, so there's a, uh, any benefits, any, any sorry, compensation or mitigation is provided, there's no guarantee that it will continue. I don't know whether you really that can be added or that's incorporated, but I, it is a concern. Okay. I think, I think Mr. Reid would like to come in at this point. Um, Chair, if I may, um, the future management, whether it's with biodiversity, green space, SUDS, is all dealt with in the Section 106 agreement. So I'm satisfied that it's fully and adequately covered. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, members, we now have a list of reasons for refusal should we agree to refuse it. Um, I think we've had all the information and debate now, so I'd like to go to a vote on this, please. Uh, members, we have the recommendation on page 107, which is then followed by a raft of conditions and informatives. Uh, so the recommendation is to approve this application subject to those conditions. Uh, members, if we could vote via the keypads, so press the blue button to register to vote, green if you're in favour, red if you're against, and yellow to abstain. If everyone can vote now, please. That's everyone's voted, and that's unanimously refused. So that application has been refused, members. Thank you very much. We will move on now to item seven, which as mentioned, I have a conflict of interest on, so I will have to remove myself for this one item. Hand over to Councillor Fain to chair this item and ask Councillor Ripith if she'd mind uh, acting as vice chair for this one item. So I will exit the room now, members, and pass you over to Councillor Fain.
Right. Thank you, committee. Let's proceed to item seven. This is um, variation of condition, the approved plans. Um, application number 2102594, oblique S73. And it relates to land to the east of Collins Close in Sheffield. Um, planning commission was granted S3052.16 for the erection of 25 dwellings, including 40% affordable. Uh, the applicant is Stone Bond Properties. The key material considerations are as set out on page 127. Um, this is brought to us because it is a uh, departure from the development plan. Um, and the presenting officer again is Michael Sexton. Michael, are you with us again? Um, I'm still here, Chair, yes. Good, I hoped you would be. Uh, we have, of course, had the opportunity to read the papers, but it would be very helpful if you would uh, summarise and update us. Uh, yeah, yeah, so there's no, no updates, Chair, so I'll go straight to a, a shorter presentation. Um, so yes, this is a, a Section 73 application that, that is before members solely, really, because it's caught by our scheme of delegation and constitution that, as a Section 73 would represent the new planning commission, it, it would be a significant departure from the development plan, but there are material considerations to weigh against that. So um, it's, it's seeking to vary in a number of conditions, as you can see. I don't propose to read those all out. Um, following uh, a 2016 planning commission for the erection of 25 dwellings, land east of Collins close Shepworth. This is the site outlined in red on the northwestern edge of Shepworth um, and a railway line running along the north west. Uh, just in terms of constraints and for clarity it is outside the development framework boundary which is denoted by this black dash line and you've got a conservation area and listed buildings to the east. So this is the consented site layouts. Um, it is currently under construction, so the permission has been implemented on this, this site. So uh, you can see it's a fairly simple uh, route through with properties either side of the new road. All of those properties are two storeys in scale, comprising detached, semi-detached terrace properties. Um, the developer is now Stone Bond Properties, who've, who've picked up the site and have found opportunities to make uh, several changes and enhancements to the scheme. This is the proposed site plan that's been put forward as part of the Section 73 application. So you can see very pretty much the same route through and layout of dwellings, same distribution of affordable houses within the site. Um, and again, they're, they're two storey properties throughout of detached, semi detached, um, and terrace properties. Um, so no real change in scale. Um, a couple of handy visuals of Sunny Shepworth and how the site. Um, would look once fully developed by Stone Bond. Just a side by side comparison, just really to highlight to members, there's very little change in terms of the, the siting and layout um, of the properties and the landscaping. Um, so, yes, not a huge amount to report on. Quite a few key considerations because it is a new uh, a new plan commission, but the principle of development, although it's outside the development framework, uh, works have commenced on site, so there is an implemented permission on this site. The housing provision remains acceptable and, and the same as before. Again, character, landscape, it's it's same situation as before. Um, probably important to answer, actually, this development will deliver a better carbon emissions um, result and it's also providing electric charging points to every property within the site so there are some enhancements being made in that respect which I think are worth highlighting um, and again no adverse impacts in terms of flood risk and drainage highway safety biodiversity lighting residential community or other matters so that's that's it from me yeah thank you usually come to questions during the debate but as happened earlier, there may be some questions where it'd be useful to have those slides. Anything for clarification? Councillor Bradman. Councillor Bradman. I just wanted to point out when you gave your introduction about the documents that we had a supplement, didn't we, about the deed of variation. The, the deed, yes, the deed of variation. Thank you. Right. Yeah, sorry, I have to comment 
on that. I, I said there was no updates. I suppose there's no updates following my update report. Um, during the course of this application, Shepherd Parish Council got in touch with the council through James Fisher um, about whether there was the opportunity to make sure that the the contribution that was being directed towards a mugger um, could be adjusted because there's no longer a, a desire and in fact they can't deliver a mugger within the site. So we've been able to accommodate the parish council's wishes. So they're still getting the, the financial contribution to offsite sports. It's just being the wording's being tweaked so they can best utilize that for the benefit of the village. So that was just in the update report to make members aware and ask for your endorsement on that. But that that's at the request of the parish council and something that Stonewall have been happy to accommodate. Thank you, Michael. That's very clear. Shall we then hear from Stonebond? I think we have Sean Martin here. Looks like uh, you're ready in place. You probably, Good afternoon. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Fine. Please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. My name is Sean Martin. I'm the planning manager for Stonebond Properties. Stonebond is a family run business has been developing homes since 1975 and we are proud to design schemes that go beyond the standard level of quality that you see on many housing schemes. We treat each site differently and do not believe in a one-size-fits-all approach. As the officer's report confirms, planning consent was granted on this site in August 2018. Prior to Stonebond purchasing the site, we felt that some subtle changes could be made to improve the scheme. These changes would improve the quality, design and overall character of the scheme without compromising the approved development. The changes we have made are minor and relate mainly to the house types in addition to increasing the quantity of trees and planting on the site. The application also seeks to discharge any outstanding conditions to enable the delivery of the development. Aside from the above changes, in all other respects, the scheme rem remains as consented, delivering 25 new homes, the same consented mix of housing, a mix of one, two, three, and four bedroom homes, 40% affordable housing, electric vehicle charging points for every property, solar panels on every dwelling, bird and bat boxes, brief friendly planting and hedgehog highways, and 42 new trees, including enhanced landscaping throughout. The proposed development will also create 77 local jobs as we will seek to use our local network of contractors to deliver the scheme. We have worked closely with your officers, following their advice and ensure that the scheme is fully compliant with the council's planning policies. The officer's re comprehensive report confirms that this has all been achieved with a recommendation for approval. There have been no objections from any of the statutory consultees or from the local residents. And I trust that the committee will be able to agree with the officer's recommendation and vote to approve this application. Thank you for your time. Do we have any questions of clarification from members of the committee? Uh, one from Councillor Dr. Jimmy Hawkins. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Through you. Um, I was just curious, you were quite precise about the number of additional trees and the landscape improvements you were making. I don't know if it's possible to have the comparison back up. Michael? It is, Councillor. Um, I should probably say that the comparison is on a site plan rather than a landscape master plan. So uh, I suspect you're going to question why there are less trees shown on the yeah. new master plan, but that's solely because it's not a landscape plan. It's just to indicate, but I can put it on screen. Um, bear with me. So, I mean, the purpose of this slide was more to show the, the layout of the dwellings, but I appreciate on here it illustratively shows planting. That is still there, and I, I can open up a landscape plan if it's required. Okay, so I couldn't... I didn't know where the additional trees were going. That's all, just, just for my own information. Okay. Um, if you could bear with me, Councillor, I will open up That's a landscape okay. plan. It's additional, it's fine, it's great. Thank you very much. Don't worry. I don't know whether Mr. Thank you. Martin wants to comment on that. Were there questions for Mr. Martin at this stage? Mr. Martin, can you hear me? Yes. Did you want to comment on that question from Councillor Hawkins? 
Yeah, the, the, the trees um, that have been additionally planted are, are street trees and in the rear gardens of the proposed properties. I think what that master plan isn't showing is the detailed planting plan that have been submitted with the application. So there were some trees shown on the previous application. Again, that, that um, approved master plan that you've seen on screen doesn't show the detailed planting. We've increased the trees, not substantially, but, but slightly from what was consented previously. Um, You're very welcome. I don't think we have any other speakers we're scheduled to hear from. Councillor Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, interestingly, I have seen this site and uh, agreed it in the first place. And I think these amendments look sensible and reasonable. And as the applicant said, I think they they to improve the application. So. Thank you. We're sort of entering into the debate here. Anyone else wanting to comment? I don't appear to have any other speakers. <laughs> Shall we proceed direct to the recommendation then? Mm -hmm. Which, if I recall, is on page 150. One four six, yes. So paragraph one six eight, officers recommend that the planning committee grants delegated authority to officers to issue a new planning permission subject to the conditions and informative set out below. And to complete and on the and condition on the completion of a deed of variation. Um, any further points or shall we proceed direct to the vote? Let's proceed direct to the mm -hmm. vote. Um, I suspect we may not need to take a vote on here. We might be able to do this by affirmation. Uh, I haven't heard anyone speak against. Are we all agreed on that recommendation? Agreed. Agreed. Good. Thank you. I have now great pleasure in handing back to uh, Councillor Henry Batchelor, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fain there showing me how it's done. <laughs> uh, okay, members, we'll continue with the agenda. We're now up to item number eight, which is on pages 115, or begins on page 115 of our agendas. 155, sorry, of our agendas, and its application um, on the land adjacent to 26 Taylor's Lane, Swavesey. The proposal is a dwelling and associated landscaping to replace an existing workshop. Uh, the applicant is a Ms. Sarah Denley. Uh, it is brought to the committee because it's been referred to the committee by Swavesey Parish Council. The presenting officer is Luke Waddington. Luke, are you with us? Hello, Chair. Yes, I am. Hopefully you can see me and hear me. We can see and hear you, Luke. So we'll hand over to you then for any updates and to present the report in front of us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I will just share my presentation and if you could confirm when you can see it, that would be brilliant. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. So yeah, so thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, as you can see from the front sheet, the application site is um, land adjacent to Taylor's Lane in Swavesey. Um, the app 26 Taylor's Lane in Swavesey, sorry. Um, the application is for the replacement of an existing wor workshop with a single story detached dwelling and it's before the committee because it's being called in by Swavesey Parish Council. Moving to the next slide, the site location plan. Um, here we can see number 26 Taylor's Lane. Um, an application site outlined in red with the two buildings in question, the larger of which 
uh, in the centre of the site is the building which is proposed to be demolished and replaced by the dwelling. Um, moving to an aerial photograph with some of the key constraints on the site. Um, as you can see again, the site is, is here. The uh, village development framework is the black dotted line that runs uh, along here, meaning the site is outside of the framework. The, the pink line is the Swavesy conservation area, um, which again the application site falls within. And this yellowy green line, which I appreciate probably isn't the clearest given the, the green uh, trees on the aerial photo, um, that denotes the outline of the um, scheduled ancient monument, um, the Castle Hill earthworks uh, within which the site is located. Um, the site is located from, uh, sorry, is accessed from Taylor's Lane uh, via, which is runs, runs down here, via an existing sort of gated driveway um, and contains two st single storey buildings, the, um, the larger steel and block work workshop unit um, and a smaller open fronted timber barn, which you can see here, which is a smaller of the two buildings. Um, and the, the dwellings here are two storey dwellings um, within the village framework. Um, just some existing uh, floor plans here before I go to some site photos, um, just to show the, the sort of footprints of the barns. Their elevations, um, fairly simple kind of utilitarian buildings. Um, so yeah, as the caption says, this is the, the view of the site from, from the entrance uh, from Taylor's Lane, looking towards the, the concrete block work building, which is to be demolished. And you can see the corner of the barn as well, um, the site access and then the access to number uh, 26 Taylor's Lane off to the right hand side. Another sort of shot at a slightly different angle, just showing that Taylor's Lane and the vegetation on the boundary. And a bit more of the access. And likewise, from the other direction with the access to the site uh, on the left hand side, just where those blue bins are. Um, this is looking sort of west along Taylor's Lane, uh, the site being behind these trees here. Um, the castle, the castle um, earthworks, sort of this, this bank here, the site sort of banks up with the trees and vegetation um, between Taylor's Lane and the, and the site itself. And then from within the site, um, this is the access looking out towards Taylor's Lane. A closer view of the, the workshop building and some of the hard standing. Um, and then the other building, the timber building, which is proposed to be retained. And various sort of storage going on in there. Um, so yes, then moving, moving on, the, um, the proposed. Sorry, the site has a, a sort of a quite a long planning history. Uh, the most recent permission, um, which relates to the buildings on the site at the moment, um, is the uh, is a, a 1995 um, consent for use of the um, both of the buildings as uh, sort of storage for building materials, building plant and a workshop. Um, and this this is a site plan for that permission, which shows various uses approved on the site and the divisions of, of uh, uses between the buildings. So moving on to the proposed development, um, as I said, it's proposed to demolish the larger concrete building, replace it with a single storey dwelling and retain the timber barn. The um, single, the, the proposed dwelling uh, would be the same height and footprint as the existing um, concrete uh, barn, uh, but would be relocated uh, two metres uh, further to the east, um, away from the existing trees along the site boundary, which you can hopefully see kind of outlined on this site plan in green. Um, to, to lessen the impact upon those, uh, the, the impacts of the development upon those trees and, and any sort of pressure to um, to remove those trees or to uh, trim them in the future. Um, so moving to elevations, um, the proposed dwelling would be clad in a black sort of timber vertical boarding. Um, as we've seen, there'd be a garden to the rear and a driveway and sort of um, grassed area to the front. So I'll just go through, again, these are side elevations very sort of simple um, form that replicates the form of the original um, or the existing, should I say, building. And internal floor plans. This is a sort of indicative landscaping layout um, of the site showing again the lawn to the rear um, and then sort of landscaping at the at the front of the site. Um, so yeah, 
that's the, the sort of layout of the site. Um, moving on to the kind of assessment, um, officers have noted that the objections, there are objections to the principle of development uh, as the site does fall outside of the, um, the development framework. So obviously, um, this is set out in detail within the committee report. However, in, in sort of a brief summary, uh, policy S7 of the uh, South Cambridge local plan can allow for development outside of frameworks where it meets exceptions in policy S7 or where it is supported by other policies within the local plan. Um, policy E14 um, being one such policy uh, that can allow for the redevelopment of employment sites for non-employment uses on the edges of development frameworks. Um, as we've seen the site, whilst on the outside of outside of the, de the development framework, uh, is on the edge of it um, and therefore um, being a, a, a site of em employment use as well and can be considered under policy E14. Um, so under E14, the development must also meet one of, of three criteria um, in order to be acceptable and for the, the loss of employment use to be acceptable. Um, the first criteria requires 12 months of marketing uh, to demonstrate that the site is, is not suitable for employment use. Um, no, no marketing has been undertaken for this particular application. Um, and so the assessment moved to the second criteria, um, which requires the development to provide a public benefit that outweighs any adverse impact on employment opportunities, uh, which would result from the loss of the, the employment land uh, and the range of available employment land. Um, so, so in terms of, of the application providing a public benefit, uh, the National Planning Practice Guidance uh, states that um, sustaining or enhancing the significance of heritage assets is an example of a public benefit and does set out in the Swabesey Conservation Area Appraisal uh, and by the conservation officer in their in their um, comments on the application, the current buildings at the, and use at the site detract from the character of the conservation area, and therefore the proposed development uh, by removing these buildings or by removing the the larger of the two buildings and, and the use is considered to enhance the the setting of the conservation area, constituting a public benefit. Um, as a site is not currently in, in frequent use for employment uh, directly at the site, and given its small scale. It's location away from major roads and adjacent to neighbouring pro residential properties, as well as the availability of similarly sized units in the area. The loss of employment use at the site is not considered to result in a significant adverse impact of the rain on the range of employment land. Um, and so the pro development is considered to meet this second criteria of policy E14. Um, so yeah, moving on to the sort of other constraints, particularly in terms of the, um, the, the conservation and the heritage aspect. Um, the, um, the conservation officer, um, as well as Historic England and Cambridgeshire County Council archaeological team, have no objections um, to the proposal subject to conditions. Um, and uh, as set in the report, set out in the report, officers consider that the uh, proposed development would not result in significant harm to the amenities of neighbouring properties, to highway safety, biodiversity, or trees uh, subject to the conditions that are set out also within the officer's report. Uh, so there are no further updates uh, from consultees. An application is recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you very much. That's much appreciated. Um, members, we've got two public speakers on this. The first being the agent for the applicant, Mr. Ed Durant. If you'd like to come forward, Ed, I believe you're probably familiar with the uh, process by now. So, uh, as you're aware, three minutes to address the committee, and then if you could hold on for any questions of clarity, please. So, in your own time. The redevelopment of the builder's yard at Taylor's Lane will deliver a high quality family home in a sustainable location. The sympathetic design and use of materials will transform the site that presently has a negative impact upon the conservation area. The parish council's engagement on such planning applications is welcomed, but in this case, their comments do not reflect the aims and wording of policy S7. These aims are to prevent unnecessary encroachment into the countryside and unsustainable forms of development. Policy S7 does not seek a blanket restriction on all development outside development frameworks. The final sentence of Policy S7, which is omitted from the Parish Council's response, confirms that development outside of development frameworks is acceptable where permitted by other policies of the local plan. The committee report confirms that the view of your professional officers that the development accords with Policy E14, which is one of the other policies referred to in Policy S7. Therefore, this application accords with policy S7. Notwithstanding the fact that the development accords with policy E14, it is also important to assess whether it achieves the aims of policy S7. 
Briefly encroachment already exists and the dwelling will be located nearer to the village framework than the existing workshop. This will provide more space for the boundary trees to thrive and screen the development. Therefore, the development will prevent further visual encroachment in the countryside. Swaver sees a minor rural centre and the new dwelling will be within walking and cycling distance of services and facilities in the village. Therefore, the development will deliver a sustainable form of development. In addition to delivering a family home in a sustainable location, the development will also deliver heritage benefits. These include a more sympathetic design of built form and landscaping of a prominent site within the conservation area. Residential is the only viable use for the site that will ensure the boundary trees are maintained and that it does not fall further into a state of neglect. More importantly, it will also prevent the extant permission for a tennis club, which extends further back into the countryside and would result in disturbance to a larger area of the scheduled ancient monument from being completed. Significant weight must be attached to these heritage benefits. The appeal, the appeal referred to by the Parish Council is materially different to this application in terms of its visual encroachment in the countryside and its distance from the village. It did not accord with the aims or wording of policy S7 as it was not supported by one of the other policies of the local plan. Moreover, there were no material planning considerations such as the heritage benefits of this application that outweighed the policy conflict. The redevelopment of the builder's yard at Taylor's Lane will deliver significant planning benefits and accords with policies E14 and S7 of the local plan. We welcome the opportunity for members to endorse the recommendation of your professional planning and conservation offices and enable the delivery of a high quality family home in this sustainable location. Thank you. Thank you very much and almost bang on time, so congratulations. Um, questions of clarity, Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Chair, for you. Uh, I'm sorry, but I must have, you, you mentioned the conflict in the VDG. Am I right? I, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to clarify. No. A no. conflict in policy. Which conflict were you referring to? Oh, I was referring, so the Parish Council in their response um, mentioned a, an appeal site, which is further outside of the village. And, and I said that in that case, there was a conflict with policy S7 because it wasn't supported by one of the other policies of the local plan. In this instance, the development is supported by one of the other policies of the local plan. So therefore, there is no conflict with policy S7. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, if I may, Chair, second point. Uh, I refer to page 169, paragraph 74, um, where... Uh, it talks about the cladding, the black cladding, and its potential, the use of the black cladding and its potential uh, conflict with the requirements in the village design guide. Um, did you consider using something else, or did you actually look at it in the context of the village design guide? We did indeed. In fact, the village design guide identified the site as a farm site, which is just clearly incorrect. Um, the, the response from the conservation officer was that he actually supported the use of the black cladding. So on, in discussions with the case officer, it was decided that the application would go forward on the basis of, of the black cladding as proposed. However, should it be an issue that the members have serious concerns about, then it could be dealt with by a materials condition. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fain, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know whether you commented on the impact on neighbouring properties. I think the only neighbouring property would perhaps be number 26. Um, and I believe there is a window which would be facing eastwards. Would you like to comment on the distance between them and the likely impact? Certainly. Um, the application has been amended to remove that window, notwithstanding the fact that it's a single-storey dwelling um, and, and any overlooking from a single-storey window at such distances would be... Um, less than significant, let's say. Councillor Khan, please. Um, I think I probably know the answer to this, but I just wanted to check. Um, I went out to see the site. I thought it was interesting. Uh, um, and it struck me that it would have been simpler to have gained, uh, um, perhaps less intuitive, to have gained access to the drive to number 26. You seem to have put the drive parallel. Was that a possibility, or was it outside your control? Correct. It's outside of land ownership. 
that you would have been defending on the first half of the game. Okay. If there's no more questions, Mr. Durant, thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll move on to our next public speaker, which I believe is Councillor Will Wright from the Parish Council. Aaron's going to help you with the technology, Councillor. Thank you. Welcome, Councillor. If you press the right-hand button on the microphone, you should be switched on. It's there okay. Thank you. Uh, before you begin, can I just check that you've got the permission of your parish council to represent their views today? Oh yes, I didn't know until uh, yesterday afternoon that in actual fact we had confirmation that I could appear in person. Mm -hmm. um, but it's given me a hectic uh, few hours to have a yeah, look through. You're, you're very welcome anyway. Um, so as with the other speakers, you have three minutes to address the committee. Then if you could stay seated in case there's any questions of clarity for yourself. Okay. So in your own time, Councillor. Right, uh, most of you might know a bit about Swavesey, but it is a very historic village. It's actually mentioned in the Doomsday Book of 1086, at which time it states that it was one of the largest, in the largest 20% of all settlements in the country. It later became a large inland Saxon port prior to the drainage of the Fens. It also had a castle with a large castle mound, which in actual fact sits immediately behind the proposed uh, alteration of what is in actual fact it's a storage storage building and it has never been a builder's yard um, to my knowledge and also to many other people's knowledge in the village at some stage in the re past history maybe not quite so recent the land has been in the ownership of uh, one family for an awful long time the actual barn as it stands there now was actually rotated through 90 degrees, possibly on one of the previous applications some time ago. Um, so the way that we looked at it at the time was, well, that would be nice because when they get permission to turn that into a house, it actually looks over the open land. Now, the proposed development is actually outside the village's development framework, as has already been said. And the granting of approval would, would create a precedent for any future development, which would be certainly irretrievable for the parish and the parishioners. And it's there for a reason. We do have uh, a neighbourhood plan, a forthcoming neighbourhood plan. It is not in effect yet. But the village does have a conservation area which includes this particular site. Uh, the Swavesey Village Design Guide was accepted, I believe, just over a year and a half ago, and the neighbourhood plan is being worked on. Uh, in addition to the uh, site behind, being the old castle mound, uh, I believe one of the gentlemen uh, pointed out that uh, a field on the other side, there was um, evidence of earthworks. And that is true. There is, they have been uh, removed pieces on a long time ago on previous investigation that there was, in actual fact, uh, an Iron Age settlement on the opposite side of the road. So it is probably one of the most historic parts, certainly one of the most historic parts of Swavesey and probably equal with uh, a lot of other places in Cambridgeshire. If it'd be possible to conclude, please. Okay. Um, the Parish Council is of the opinion that the proposed materials um, in the proposed uh, new building would not complement the location of the neighbourhood property. And basically, we are completely against it because not not because of uh, what it is, but because of where it is. And um, at the end of the day, having had uh, a conservation area and a protected area in the village, 
something like this going through would create a precedent and we might as well give up and uh, all go into three and a half storey townhouses. I'll answer any questions that you have. But yeah, if you could stay seated, please, that would be useful. Uh, so I think there are some questions for yourself. Councillor Bradman. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Through you. Um, good afternoon. I just wanted to check. Uh, in our papers at paragraph 13, it says, uh, in light of the precedent set by recent developments already granted permission within the scheduled area of the monument, uh, in this instance, this was the county council speaking, uh, they said they did not object to the development. Could you just kind of direct us to where, you know, what were those other recent I'm, developments? I'm presuming they are thinking of uh, um, a couple of developments down Hale Road, which is um, you, the actual diagrams didn't show where Hale Road was. But uh, just round the corner from uh, the entrance to this proposed site, um, the actual highways stop and they become uh, two Swavesey byways, one going straight on down to uh, the River Ouse and the other one goes left towards uh, Ben Drayton. And during the open season for developers, permission was granted for two houses to be built along Hale Road, probably about um, three to 400 yards from this actual site. But in addition, there was a further application for a dwelling uh, between the two sites, uh, which was actually turned down and refused by the council in here because, uh, because the local plan was in force and it was outside the village development boundary. Um, can I just ask through you, Chairman? Well, and the castle, it, is that to the north? The carport. What's going to be the carport? Yes. No, 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 the castle. Castle. The, 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 the castle mound. Is that to the north? Of castle this? mound is to the north, yes. Okay. In actual fact, when you look at Historic England's diagram, it actually draws the castle mound site and then it kind of like turns left, enclosing this actual entire field and then goes to the field where the actual Iron Age site was. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Through yourself, Chair. Um, one thing that seems in the parish council response to be of particular um, issue is in relation to the cladding. I'm just wondering if you're able to expand on that at all. Why, why it is in the design guide that the parish council does not want black cladding? Okay. Thank you, Chair. Yep. Um, it's, it was something that uh, came up in the um, in the village design guide. Um, one thing we do not want is two and a half storey townhouses in Swavesey. It is a rural historic village. And the other thing, uh, the general opinion of the majority of uh, people doing the design guide, which did also make reference and uh, ask parishioners what they thought, the general opinion was we do not want black cladding. It needs to be more natural colours, okay. such as various hues and shades of brown, Thank that you. is wood. Anything else, Phil? No, thank you, Chair. Okay. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you, I think I, I need to um, kind of uh, pick up on that one. It's, there's, there's two things here that um, I just want to clarify with you. The first is the statement uh, from the parish council that says, the existing workshop building has not been used previously for agricultural purposes, therefore does not consider it to be a barn eligible for conversion or redevelopment. But it was, a, it was used for something, wasn't it? And I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm just not clear why it's not eligible from the parish council's viewpoint. Um, well, to the knowledge of most people and anybody in the, in the village, um, it has only been used for storage. Storage of building materials, yes, because the owner of the actual site has done a fair amount of development in other areas, but it has never been a workshop, uh, not to anybody's knowledge in the village. And I'm talking about myself and people that have been in the village for 40 years or more. 
Okay, thank you for that. But it's, it's still a building that was used for something. Okay, I'll leave that. The other thing is the cladding. I mean, I thought reading through, the issue was that houses that are not nowhere near farms or not farm buildings shouldn't have the black cladding because the cladding is more associated with farm buildings. Is, have I misunderstood? Are we, we talking about wooden black cladding here? Correct, yeah. yeah. Sorry, um, precise, wooden black cladding. The opinion, the bulk of the people's opinion is they would prefer to have the hue of a natural wood, either lighter, obviously some wood is light, some wood is darker. Okay. But having black cladding, that's one thing that, the, when it came out, the majority said they didn't want it. And, and to me, there's no, there's nothing racist or anything like that in there. It was just that the general opinion is the cladding on the buildings should be of a various, whatever it is, a dark brown, a light brown, an intermediate brown. So it gives the impression that it is, in actual fact, part wood. Okay. But in this case where you already have one of the, the ancillary building potentially with black cladding, you don't consider that having the main building as a black as having black cladding would be well, a good idea. If it's already there, there's nothing we can do about it, is there? <laughs> you know what no. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. nothing we can do about it. If it's gone there, it's there. And yeah. Okay. And, and we're not the sort of people that go and set fire to it just because it's green colour. <laughs> okay, thank you. I didn't hear that. Yeah. Thank I didn't you. say it. Thank you, Will. <laughs> Please don't mean it that. <laughs> um, members, yeah, this cast is reminding me as well, if the, if the colour of the cladding is an issue for the committee, then we obviously can condition a different colour. It's yeah. as simple as that. Um, members, Councillor Bradham. Thank you, Chairman. I would like to have two matters of legal advice. Please tell me when that's the appropriate time to do that. At the moment, we're just asking questions of clarity for the, for the speaker at the moment. Councillor Ripley? Apologies, I was getting ahead of myself. Okay. Well, if there's no further questions of clarity, we thank you very much for your time, Councillor, and for okay. waiting all day and, <laughs> and afternoon. It's uh, appreciate it's a long process, but so we thank you for your patience. That's all right. Thank you for listening to me. Okay, members, we've heard from all the public speakers, so I think we'll be moving into the debate now, and uh, I believe, well, Councillor Bradman, you'll first cab off the rank. Thank you. Um, with your permission, I may come back later, but certainly the legal issues I want a clarification on, um, Chairman, were we are very often told uh, as planning committee members that, that each application is on its own merits, and yet in the... Uh, paragraph I quoted from the County Council Historic Environment Team at paragraph 13, page 159, there is reference to, in, the, in light of the precedent set by recent developments, already granted permission within the scheduled area of the monument, da, 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 we might, we might, we do not object. So I just wanted to know to what degree do we look at this as a separate new application on its own merits, or is that, has a precedent set been within the scheduled monument area for developments to be allowed? So that's the first one. Should we take that one first, actually? Yep, sure. I think that's quite an important one. Uh, Mr. Reid, are you able to comment or this? Uh, thank you, Chair. I was going to pass it over to my planning colleague. Thanks, Stephen. Um, uh, so I read that advice from the parish councillors as being uh, uh, that they have considered um, other recent effects on the scheduled ancient monument in reaching their conclusion that this particular development, uh, considered on its own, uh, is not causing any harm. So I think it's perfectly acceptable for them in regard to their consideration solely around the scheduled ancient monument to consider what other effects have, there have been on that monument from other developments. Uh, in, in reaching a decision on whether or not this is going to cause any harm in heritage terms to that uh, scheduled ancient monument. Thank you. Um, your second question? So just to clarify, we consider this as an application on its own merit? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Right, so the second one is to do with the agricultural use because um, I just want to clarify whether what is being proposed is being considered legitimate 
one-for-one -one replacement of an existing agricultural building for a dwelling, or whether there are, whether effectively, if that wasn't an agricultural building, whether this would be effectively considered as a new building in the countryside. Through you, Chair, you might like to ask the case officer to comment, but my reading of the report is that um, we're not citing it as being an agricultural building, more as an employment uh, use that will then go to non-employment use, but it might be that Luke can clarify that. Sir. And, and if you could clarify what, what, it, what is permitted in this particular type, this particular location, what would be permitted? Okay, Luke? Hello, Hello, yes, happy to take those questions. So, the yeah, um, Chris Cast is correct. The, the building itself isn't currently a building in agricultural use. Um, as I mentioned, I think, in the report as well, it's it's um, a, a building for a store uh, with a, a, an ancillary sort of workshop, uh, mostly for yeah, storage of, of builders, um, builders' goods and plant, things like that. Um, in terms of what would, would be permitted, I mean, there, I believe there's a policy in the local plan for conversion of agricultural buildings, but it's not an agricultural building. Um, so we're assessing it under policy 14, um, which relates to the loss of employment use and to non-employment uses, um, which, resident, which residential use uh, is a non-employment use. Um, so, so that's the sort of the, the basis on, upon which, uh, which it's being assessed or which it has been assessed within the report. I don't know if that clarifies the, the, uh, the question or not. considering it an existing building that's in its own right permitted the previous building and we're simply saying is it acceptable that we we have potential loss of employment use in order that this is turned into a dwelling we're not making a decision about whether it's okay to have a building in this location no yeah it's it's yeah so the the consideration is is whether the um the redevelopment of the site for non-employment use um, is acceptable under policy 14. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, that's clear. Uh, Councillor Ripper, please. Um, into debate now? If We're into the debate, yes. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, looking at this application on paper and also on the presentation and having heard um, the comments from the speakers, um, I think it looks like a good application and an improvement to me, my mind um, on what is there currently. And for me, the black cladding actually goes quite well with the other building, which is there and going to be retained. Um, so for me, I, I'm viewing it quite favourably at the moment. OK, thank you very much. Councillor Cullen, please. <coughs> I went, I was interested in looking at the application and I thought it looked an interesting application, but I was rather worried that the uh, building looked a bit bizarre, so I went out to look at the site, uh, because we didn't have a, we're not having a site visit, so I thought I needed to go and have a look. Uh, I'm very glad I did. It's a very interesting site, as the history of the area, which is exposed on a board right next, very close to the, uh, the building, uh, this uh, outlines the history of, um, of Swayze, and it's in, within the old um, um, medieval town area. Uh, the castle is actually bound, it's actually on the other side of the road, um, beyond the, beyond the um, graveyard, uh, and you can still see the castle bound, it's marked on the map. Um, the, I was wor worried about the dark, uh, about the building being rather uh, small and rather, uh, rather like an uh, industrial building itself. When you come out and look at the site, it actually fits in perfectly. And, it was very, and that's where I found the, the site visit was very helpful. Because Having a low building like that, uh, which matches with the other building, doesn't take the extension of the adjoining two buildings. I think these are the new buildings that uh, previous development are talking to, the number 26 and I think it must be 24, which are new, uh, uh, relatively recent buildings, probably within the last 10 to 15 years, uh, brick buildings, two-story houses within the development framework. By having a low building, it doesn't seem to be taking the, extend the development framework beyond it. It's well screened. It uh, doesn't impact on the area around it. Um, uh, and, is rather, and I think it would be rather imaginative. Um, so uh, I would commend the applicant on this, and, and I generally am in favour of it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Fain, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Thank you, Chair. There are a couple of issues here. I think the very limited concerns of the Historic England and Cambridgeshire County Council would seem to be met by condition 14. Uh, so I think uh, the, in the light of the, neither having any objection to this, um, that is not to be an issue. Um, there's the question of the cladding and whether there should be a, a condition on that to comply with the finished design guide. I'm not sure that I think there should be. Um, the village design guide states uh, should have a simple and unified material character in keeping with the rural setting. While there is a black barn to be retained, uh, which is effectively the rural setting, Furthermore, the conservation officer was quite clear that um, whilst as a rule in much of the conservation area, black cladding would bring an alien and artificial element into the streetscape, that is not the case on this site. And this application is one to which the rule doesn't apply. So then I'm left with the key concern raised, or to my mind, the key concern raised by the parish council. And this is the interpretation of policy DP7. Um, outside village frameworks, only development for agriculture, horticulture, forestry, outdoor review, etc., will be permitted. And the parish council says granting of approval for development outside the stated village boundary sets a precedent for future development that may be irretrievable. However, as um, Mr. Durrant pointed out, there is actually slightly more to that sentence. And I wonder whether it would be helpful to ask officers to clarify how absolute is policy DP7, I think that's the right number, isn't it, um, on developments outside the village framework? Thank you. So I think it's policy S7, actually. Um, yeah. But Chris, I don't know if you can clarify for us. Uh, through you, Councillor Fain, you're correct. There is a second part to policy S7, which states uh, outside development frameworks, any allocations within neighbourhood plans that have come into force and development for agriculture, horticulture, forestry, outdoor recreation, and other uses which need to be located in the countryside. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> or, well, here's the important bit, or where supported by other policies in this plan will be permitted. So that's the, the hook, which um, obviously in the officer report then leads on to consideration of policy E14, um, as set out in the report. Thank you, Chair. Well, Chair, thank you. In, in the light of that response and what I said earlier, I would be inclined to uh, support the officer's recommendation on this. Thank you, Councillor Fain. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I think, I think what um, that I sort of took from the parish council representation is obviously there is concern around the materials that are being used. Um, there are other ones as well, I grant you, but um, and we also know you know, Swayze has seen development that it's not wanted um, in the style of townhousing and things like that. So I can understand why there would be apprehension. Um, I was wondering, I think I probably will move it unless I get told I absolutely can't, um, which I often get told, so brace yourselves, um, that we set a condition that means that materials that are going to be used, as we do in some other applications, are submitted and, and consulted on with the parish before actually um, being used and implemented. We've used this condition in other places. Um, I know in my patch, well, we've had slight sensitive um, sites where essentially prior to development pallets, with all this conversation going on, will I be allowed, will I not be allowed? Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I would like to imp um, suggest that we put that, put that in, in the hope that then through that process we'll be able to get some materials that are agreeable um, or at least less controversial, Chair. Okay, I think we're going to hear from Chris Carter then. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, no problem with a, a condition requiring uh, submission of details of materials. It's unusual to... Um, include the parish council as part of that process. They, they could be a consultee to that process, but the decision would, of course, have to rest with the district council ultimately. Um, but I think that we could do that, and clearly the wording of any condition is for the committee to determine, so. Can I okay. clarify, Chairman? 
I was saying that the parish council could have input through that consultation. I, I didn't say that they would decide. Obviously, they're not a planning authority. Um, okay. But yeah. Okay, so just for clarity, that if you were to propose a new condition, it would be that uh, any or all the more controversial building materials will be um, be in, cons in consultation with the district council. I think I think all external um, or cladding ex materials. Yeah, materials. Because it does suggest about using some brick and things, which is more fitting. So anything visually, externally, any materials being used on the building itself um, would go would go for authorisation from the planning authority in you know, through the normal consultation process, which is what we normally have, where an applicant has to provide a sample mm. of of okay. the stone being used or the cladding. Um, and that way we're not actually agreeing to black cladding or, or any of those other things today. Okay, understood. Mr Carter? Chair, through you, just to be clear, we're talking about walls and roof, not windows. Um, so we're talking about cladding, brickwork and roof tiles or slates rather than... Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think those are the ones that I was more concerned around, so I think those are the main ones. Yes, yeah, um, so any, any materials used... Okay, I will come back to that at the end uh, before we take any decision on anything. Um, but I do want to continue with the debate for the moment, please. Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I've um, been looking at the observations of the Conservation Officer, and I, I'm inclined to agree that that is the case. The aesthetic of um, the proposed building seems to be to enhance the the visual impact rather than detract from it. So I'm inclined to um, to support this application. Thank you very much. Uh, any further speakers in the debate, please? Councillor Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I agree with the proposal that materials should be submitted for consideration by the local planning authority and that the the parish council should feed into that. But I just wanted to query, it's perhaps not for me to query what the village design guide says, but um, wood would always have been treated with tar um, to, to keep it waterproof and um, in good condition, which was black. <laughs> I just find it slightly odd that the parish council is um, concerned about that because it seems the most natural thing in the world to treat wood with yeah. but the other observation I made was that in the drawings and I cannot pretend to have read that bit in detail but it looked actually to me as if the cladding might have, might possibly have been metal um, so I just wanted to clarify that issue um, that obviously that would be covered by the requirement Indeed, if we, so if we do have the conditions the <laughs> materials would be <laughs> agreed with the local planning authority anyway um, do we need clarity on that now? Whether Luke, if you could very quickly tell us the cladding is in the timber. Hello, yes. Yeah, the, the cladding is intended to be to be timber cladding. Um, can I also just, just point out that um, condition three um, of the, uh, I think it's on page 173, it begins on page 173 of the agenda, um, does state that um, no demolition other than, um, sorry, no development other than demolition should take place. Um, until samples of the external materials to be used in the construction of the development have been submitted to and approved by the local planning authority. And I wondered whether that um, was sufficient in itself to um, sort of cover the, the issues that members have just been discussing um, or, or, or not.
did we did, did we get the recommendation in? <laughs> Sorry, everyone. If Aaron, can we clarify? Are we back on now? We are back on now. Okay, well, just for clarity, to summarize what we've just decided for anyone that may have missed it who's listening online, uh, the committee just voted unanimously to approve the recommendation um, with the addition, um, sorry, the amendment to condition three in the paper, which includes the parish council uh, in any discussion around the cladding materials. Okay, so that application is approved. Uh, members have had a quick Request for a break, so I'm going to re sorry, I'm going to adjourn us now for ten minutes, and we can come back at three o'clock. Thank you very much.
from members. We are back live again and the meeting was resumed. So we're proceeding with agenda item number nine, which is an application at the land northwest of 15 Orchard Close Cottenham, which is within the Cottenham Parish. It's an outline planning commission for a single, single story self build dwelling with all of the matters reserved. Uh, the applicant is down as Miss Geraldine Roper on the on our papers, but I believe it's actually South Cans uh, who is the actual applicant, hence why it's coming before us today. Uh, the presenting officer is Phoebe Carter. Phoebe, are you with us? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Phoebe. So, yeah, if you could give us any updates to the report we have in front of us and then present the item, please. Uh, good afternoon. There are no additional updates, so I'll move on with the presentation. So uh, the land is adjacent to 15 Orchard Close, it's set within a corner plot at the head of a cul-de-sac which has been divided from number 15. Uh, the proposed plot uh, originally formed garden land of number 15. Um, the built form of the area is predominantly residential, comprising a mix of single storey and two storey dwellings set around an open green space. Um, the site constraints um, fall within the development framework of Cottenham and there are no other constraints on the site. Um, as uh, the chair said, the application is being brought before the committee as the applicant is a member, of, uh, is a district council. Uh, the proposed application seeks outline planning permission with all matters reserved for the erection of a new self built dwelling and therefore the details of access, appearance, landscaping, layout and scale of the proposed development are matters reserved for later approval. So, um, the plot of land is just tucked in here. And you can see that the property here was approved in 2019 as another bungalow and was built out in 2020. Um, officers consider that the single storey dwelling shown on the indicative plans would likely be appropriate in terms of siting and overall scale and would not amount to overdevelopment of the site. It is acknowledged that there are properties in the immediate setting and the design of the proposal that comes forward should not overwhelm or dominate this context. However, in regards to third party concerns, details of the proposal in terms of overlooking loss of privacy, access and parking would need to be addressed within any reserved matters application. The indicative plans indicate that access and parking could be achieved in this location. The Parish Council supports the application subject to access being acceptable to the Highways Authority. Uh, the local authority, Highways Authority have reviewed the application and details would need to be submitted at the reserve matters stage to ensure that the proposal could be achieved without adverse impact on highway safety. Taking the above into account, officer's recommendation is one of approval subject to the conditions and the details reserved. Thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. And just for absolute clarity, uh, in terms of the reason why it's becoming before us, it's because South Cams are the applicants rather than Miss Geraldine Roper applying for herself. Yes, yes, that's correct. OK, good. Just wanted to clarify that. Um, we have no... Councillor Bradham, you're looking... Well, I'm looking confused because it says applicant, Miss Geraldine Roper. Yeah, I think that's incorrect. I think Miss Geraldine Roper is, a, is an officer at this council who works in the self-build department and she has applied on behalf of South Cams. So I think that's a typo there. It should say yes, South it, Cambridgeshire. It then goes on to repeat and says applicant works... The application has been brought to the committee because the applicant works for the local authority. Again, I think. Are you sure? Can we clarify whether it is an application for an individual? Yeah, I think that would be useful to clarify, please, Phoebe. Uh, the application is the applicant is South Cambridge District Council, and Geraldine Raper works for the department who's put the application forward. Okay, so when, when we have the reason for the application being brought to the committee, it's because the applicant is the local authority rather than works for? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Fain, please. Uh, 
yes, thank you. You showed us an, uh, an aerial photograph showing the two trees on the site. I just wonder if you have any other photographs that might give us a better impression of those trees and whether those are likely to be impacted by the development as proposed. Um, I'll just bring up the presentation again. So these three trees fall within the site here, which are, and the blue line around them is the root protection zone for the trees. And these are intended to be retained. However, the site does not fall within the conservation area and the trees have no protection order on them. Um, and the aerial show, so, it's this tree in here and this tree and this tree. Um, the rest of the uh, works along here are just um, low-lying shrubs and then sort of overgrown grass area, uh, which was the garden land of number 15. For the debate, please, Councillor Ted Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think from a planning perspective, we can see that a, a dwelling does fit. It'd be quite a small one, but it, it does fit there. Um, so I think from a planning perspective, um, then the outline could be granted. Um, whether we should be doing this is another matter. I'm, I'm not convinced we should. I'd much rather see a council house being built there rather than sending off for self-build. But from a planning point of view, it is what it is. Thank you. Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you. I, I note that one of the objections is um, people have expressed concern about um, noise and disturbance in the construction. And looking at the, the plan, um, the, the um, situation of Orchard Close, I can see that this is something that's cropped up in other developments that construction vehicles block up the road and, and cause a, a lot of hindrance to neighbours. Is there any way that the um, construction vehicles could be made to actually be on the site and not, on the, not parking on the road? Okay. I've just been pointed towards condition four in our papers. Do you have a page, Chris? 188, number four. Yeah, so no development shall start until construction environmental management plan has been submitted. Is that so, so, so can that be, can, do we have to wait for that to come later or? Yeah, okay. so, so that will come as part of the reserve matters. Okay, right? thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradman? On that same point, so Frankly, so what? I mean, yes, okay, it's important that we have a construction environment management plan, but they're not going to be able to put vehicles on site, are they? Because it, the access is, is really quite narrow. Um, and vehicles, I think it, it seems unlikely to me that vehicles are going to be able to access the site. You know, I can just see a whole load of vehicles being parked out on Orchard Close and completely blocking it. Yeah, okay. Understood. I think Mr. Carter wants to come in. Here. Thanks, Chair. I, I think um, it's just important to note what the scale of this proposal is. And of course, people extend their houses in locations like this all the time, and builders have to park somewhere. So, to a great extent, we're reliant on the uh, the, the appropriate parking of vehicles by tradespeople. Um, and you know, that's not something we can entirely control, as you know. We can ask for details of any measures to be included in a construction management plan. Um, but I think it's important to note that this is a potentially a single dwelling, the precise details of which we don't have at this stage, because that will come with reserve matters. Um, and you know, it, it's a, a different scale to perhaps a multiple dwelling site that you might have even more vehicles. It's just important to note that point, I think. Okay, thank you. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Uh, thank you um, very much, Chair. Um, two points, really. Um, I would quite like to see the the map again, if the officer could show that, because I, I do have some concerns about quite what we're cramming on this plot and whether we've got, um, uh, you know, we can have on-site parking where, where the house is there and whether there's a safe access or not. It seems very 
narrow that access. Um, I do have some concerns about this. I, I, I reflect the comment that was said earlier as well. This is not a planning matter, but given where the council and where the applicant, I will say this is a point of policy. I don't like the fact that we keep building on or oh, selling off council land for private housing. We could be building some council houses there, but that's not a material consideration for the planning application. Um, in relation to parking, there are two spaces which meet the standards shown on the plan. It's quite faint. I'm sort of outlining where they are here. There are two spaces staggered, so they're 2.5 by 5 metres. The access between the fence and the edge of the site is approximately 4 metres, which is considered acceptable as an access in and out of the site. Okay. It's probably worth noting the plan's indicative as well, Phoebe. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Ripoth, please. Um, following on from what people have said, I was going to suggest we went to a vote because what we're voting on and what we're talking about is actually sort of further down the line. Mm -hmm. Is that a proposal? Yes. <laughs> that we go to a vote. Second by Councillor Fain. So, okay, members, we've got a proposal to go to the vote. Is everyone content with that? Not seeing any shakes of the head, so we'll go ahead. Members, we have a recommendation on page 187 of our agendas here. Um, that planning permission is granted, and then we have a list of conditions beneath that. So, members, can I take by affirmation that people are happy to approve this, or do we need a vote? Agreed. Does anyone... Does anyone wish to vote against this? If so, we'll go to a vote. Agreed? Okay, that's agreed unanimously. Good. Thank you very much. That is approved. We will move on to agenda item 10, which is on pages 191 of our agenda, and it's an application at Fenditton and Fulbourne forward slash Little Wilbraham, Primrose Farm, uh, which I assume is in Little Wilbraham. Um, it's... The application is for the installation of one sun pipe to a kitchen extension. It's a retrospective application because the work's already happened. And the reason it's here today because the applicant is a, uh, a member of this local authority, Councillor Daunton, who we heard from earlier. Um, count, uh, not Councillor, Jane Rodens is the presenting officer. Okay, so we have Richard Fitzjohn uh, presenting this application to us. Richard, do we have you? Good afternoon, Chair. Afternoon, Richard. Um, yeah, so if you could give us any updates to the application and then please introduce it for us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's no updates, so I'll um, get straight to the presentation. You able to see my screen, Chair? Yes, we can. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. Uh, agenda item 10 seeks retrospective listed building consent for the installation of a sun pipe within the roof of a recently constructed extension to the Grade 2 listed building known as Primrose Farm in Little Wilbraham. Uh, planning permission and listed building consent has been approved the extension to the listed building, uh, though the permissions did not include the sun tube. The application site is located on the west side of Primrose Farm Road, within the countryside, within the Greenbelt and within the Little Wilbraham Conservation Area. The dwelling to which the application relates is a Grade 2 listed building, uh, though the sun pipe has been installed within a, the recent extension to it. This plan shows the location of the dwelling, um, which is the larger building to the southern section of the site. This plan here shows the location of the sun pipe, um, which is the um, small black square with the small circle within it, located just here. The elevation plan here shows the location of the sun pipe again. It's located on the rear roof slope 
of the single story rear extension. And this slide shows a photo of the sun pipe. So the sun pipe um, blends discreetly and synthetically with the roof slates of the rear extension, um, and it's only visible from the rear of the property. The key considerations in the determination of this application are the principle of development, green belt impacts, character and appearance of the area, heritage impacts and residential amenity impacts. Officers consider that the sun pipe does not result in a disproportionate addition to the original building, does not ad adversely affect the listed building or the conservation area, and does not create any residential amenity impacts which would be harmful. The Council's Conservation Officer has no objections to the application, and the application is therefore recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, members, do we need any debate on this? Yes, Councillor Bradman. Right. The photographs show that it's invisible, pretty much, um, even from the rear of the property. Uh, and I, I'd like to suggest we move to a vote. Yep, that's where I was going with it. So <laughs> there's no more debate needed. Um, members, are we content to go to the vote on this? Great. Nods, yeah. And um, I'll do it properly. The, the recommendation is on page 197. The recommendation is for approval. So members, can I take that by affirmation, please? Agreed. 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 Superb. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 11, members. An application for 19 Warman's Lane, Swavesey. And we're just noting Councillor Richard Williams has left the meeting. Um, so as I was saying, item 11, 19 Warman's Lane, Swavesey. The proposal is for an erection of a four bed dwelling with garage and office. Applicant is Mr. Morby. Um, the reason it's brought to the committee is again, because the landowner is a district councillor at this local authority. The presenting officer is Dean Scrivener. Dean, do we have you? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. So, yeah, if you could please give us any updates, if there are any, and then present the report, please. Yeah, there are no updates, so I'll just um, crack on the presentation. If you just let me know when you can see my slides. Yes, we can see them. Okay, yep, so this is an application for an erection of four-bed dwelling with a garage and an office. So the existing site is located off Warman's Lane, which runs along here, and with the access bar, an existing access was already constructed, and this is the vacant plot at the moment. Uh, this is just an image of the existing um, plot, which contains grasslands and shrubs and trees, um, which doesn't really contribute to the significance conservation area or the character of the area. So the main site constraints, so the plot is situated here. Um, it's within the village development framework of Swavesey, as well as the conservation area, uh, which you can see that purple um, line there. And it's also located within the, um, flood zone three, um, which is high risk of flooding. So there's a proposed site plan. So this just shows the um, location of the proposed dwelling here and the new garage and office um, situated here, past standing to the front um, and the access will, which will be used um, to access the dwelling. And as you can see, there'll be a generous garden space for future occupants to enjoy. These are the proposed four plans. So the ground floor plan on your left and first floor plan on the right. Um, just circled a new window, which was addition, um, which was um, amended by the planning application process to um, uh, create some visual interests within this blank elevation, the southern elevation. So this is the front elevation here. And this is the uh, side north elevation here. As you can see, it's relatively simple in design, character and appearance. Again, that's just showing that addition of a window, um, which was um, recommended by the conservation officer for visual interest. That's the size uh, south elevation. 
and that's the rear deceleration. This is this is the um, floor plans of the proposed garage office. So as you can see, the the ground floor plan or ground floor area will be used for um, parking, which allow two cars to park inside. First floor proposed as office, and that's the roof plan proposed with two roof lights. These are elevations of the garage office. So that would be the rear elevation. Uh, that's the front elevation. That's the side showing the stairs up to the office at the top. And that's the other side elevation, which is blank. So design and visual impacts, um, as you can see, there's the street scene um, cross section. Uh, the overall height and scale of the building is in keeping with other neighboring uh, dwellings. Doesn't, really, doesn't sit any higher. So therefore the visual impact is considered to be minimal. And this is just a, a diagram of the um, proposed scheme and uh, the materials would be a buff brick with a natural slate roof and the um, garage would be oak cladding with a natural slate roof as well, which is considered to be in keeping with the conservation area and the Swavesy SPD village design guide. So in terms of neighbouring amenity, um, this plan just shows the relative distances from each of the elevations from the neighbouring boundaries. As you can see, the location of the dwelling is considered to be set at a reasonable distance from neighbouring dwellings to not result in any overbearing, overlooking or overshadowing impacts. And this distance here to number 19 um, to the south is relatively close. Um, However, that first floor window, which is an addition to the scheme, um, will be of straw glaze and that's secured by condition to prevent any overlooking impact upon this garden area. Um, obviously, this garden area here is very large and therefore um, you would see the dwelling from standing in this garden. Um, but in terms of uh, the size of the garden, it's not considered to result in any impact to result in any reason for refusal. Um, the garage here would obviously be seen from this neighbouring plot here. Um, however, the distance of 3.2 metres is considered to, be, is considered to be a reasonable distance away to not result in any overbearing or overshadowing impacts. Uh, there was a comment from a neighbour property um, at the back here on Market Street, suggesting that the roof lights uh, would result in any overlooking impact upon these neighbouring properties. However, those roof lights are set at 1.8 metres above floor level, and therefore officers are satisfied that no overlooking impact would result. Access arrangements. So the property, the proposal would be accessed via an existing access, which is constructed um, to accommodate these two dwellings here under an application approved in 2016. And um, highways have raised a concern that the application wasn't um, supplemented by inter-vehicle visibility display drawing, and um, as part of the application, and um, to demonstrate sufficient visibility at this access point. Um, however, this drawing was submitted as part of the application approved in 2016. Um, and as such, this access has now been constructed um, and therefore officers are um, of the view that the visibility is sufficient um, and the proposal would not result in any um, significant detrimental harm upon the effective operation of the highway. So this is the drawing which was approved under the 2016 application. Um, and this is the purple dashed line just showing the vehicle intervisibility inter display, um, which was approved under the application serving these two dwellings. So the main considerations, um, in terms of principle, the application site is located in the space of development framework, and therefore the principle is supported in this location. Um, in terms of visual impacts, the post scale of development would be in keeping neighboring dwellings within the locality. And the proposed materials are considered to be in keeping the historic core of the village. Location of the proposed dwelling and garage slash office are considered to be set at a reasonable distance from the neighbouring properties to not result in any significant harmful overbearing, overlooking or overshadowing impacts. The proposal would use the existing access as approved on the previous application in 2016 and would also provide two parking spaces within the curtilage of the site. In terms of flood risk, um, the, site, the site is located in flood zone 3, which is obviously high risk. Um, the original flood risk assessment submitted in the application has been amended um, to satisfy the environmental agency in terms of um, uh, mitigation against uh, flood flooding and the EA has removed their objections subject to condition.
Therefore, officers are of the view that the application should be approved subject to conditions and forms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, members, again, do we need any debate on this one or questions of clarity for the officer? Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to check. It says at paragraph 12, I, I, I'm, I'm just wanted to understand is the Ellingham Consulting the district councillor that this application relates to? Or is that something completely different and it's just coincidental that they're the same name? Toby, can you, sorry, Dean, can you come back on that? Um, I believe it's something different. Um, it's, it's, it's just coincidence that's the same name. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Ripper, please. Apologies if this is, I'm particularly picky, but why a chimney on a new build? I, I'm just concerned for the environmental sort of elements of that. Okay. I'm not sure who can answer. Dean, can you answer that? Um, I think the neighbouring properties all have chimneys, so it was uh, a, uh, an element of design that was considered to be in keeping with the locality um, of the area, as, as well as the conservation area. So I think it was an element that uh, we wanted to, to maintain. And it was also um, included within the pre-application um, and the conservation officer um, didn't uh, want to retain that, that, that element, so um, we ran with it. Okay. Uh, Councillor Khan, please. Um, I went back to look at this site as well because well, I was in Swayze from the other one. Um, the access to the site, is very, um, I understand that it's acceptable because of the existing uh, access on there, but in terms of construction access, the access from um, uh, to, to exit Warman's Lane directly onto the, high, uh, the main road, you go between narrow buildings, is absolutely lethal. It's virtually impossible to come out safely. Um, and my fear is that if the lorries start coming out there, it would be really very dangerous. Can you control within the construction plan um, the route taken by vehicles approaching that site? number one and secondly there was works going on site when i went to have a look at it i don't know whether that was linked to the existing development on site but uh, i don't know how that relates to this Dean, can you answer this uh, yeah so we have conditioned a traffic management plan that will assess um contract vehicle parking contract vehicle movements in and out of the site so we will um um try and try and control that uh, in terms of safety aspect um in terms of the works currently ongoing, I think they're probably associated with the neighbouring development which was approved in 2016, as opposed to this application um, in front of us now. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. I was, I was just going to reflect on something um, in the comments from Councillor Rippeth about the chimney, just that um, recently I looked at getting an air source heat pump and actually one of the things that they double check is that you have a secondary form of heating. Um, and so if you have like a log stove obviously using the right wood and what have you. Um, so it can sometimes be actually a requirement that you have a second way of heating before they'll put it in, or, or was the case with what I was looking at. So that might help clarify, but also I think actually it has an aesthetic purpose as well as a functional one. Because um, most people, I don't think, use their chimneys these days or have fireplaces blocked up, but it would give symmetry to the other buildings. Thank you very much. Councillor Hawkins, please. Thank you, Chair. There was the one question I had on this, which was to do with the um, blood risk and blood risk assessment. And I note there's the objection has been removed. But I did wonder, again, back to the why isn't the drainage design submitted at the same time? Why? We have so many drilling conditions that we have to discharge. We see. Why wasn't it submitted at the same time? Dean, not sure if you can answer that, but any comment from yourself? Um, well, the application had submitted a published assessment um, originally and then had obviously had been amended, um, which satisfied the EA, um, who have also recommended that the application is carried in accordance with those mitigation measures. Um, 
I understand what uh, Councillor Hawkins is saying, but um, in terms of mitigation, mitigating that that impact, we're confident that um, the proposal will not uh, be liable to flood risk. Submission of the scheme for the disposal of surface water. Hello, I already have something for flood water. I think, I think Mr. Carter is about to jump in. I, I'm not sure if it's any help, but I think, as I think Michael Sexton was saying in an earlier item, it, it's because it's part of a process. So, you know, the applicant is establishing with the flood risk assessment that in principle a scheme can be designed, and the environment agency said, yes, it can, subject to these further details, which will come down the line. And on the basis that the environment agency are accepting the detail of the flood risk assessment, um, I think um, we can conclude that they're satisfied that these further matters can also be addressed, uh, particularly in the case of a single dwelling. Thank you, Chris. Um, I don't think there's any further speakers. Members, I'd like to go to a decision on this, please. Um, we have a recommendation on page 204. Uh, the officers recommend the planning committee approves following um, sort of subject to the conditions that are listed below. So, members, I haven't heard anyone speaking against this. So, again, can I, can we take this by affirmation? Agreed. Agreed. Great. Thank you very much. So, that is approved. Thank you very much, Dean. Yes, thank you. Members, we move on to agenda item 12, the enforcement report. Do we have, is it Will who's going to update us? Will, good yes, afternoon. Sir, good afternoon. Good to see you. Um, so, yeah, we have a report, enforcement report, members, page 211. Uh, Will, if you'd like to present it, please. Yeah, um, just some verbal updates uh, regarding the Smithy Fen. Uh, the report has been now been completed by the outside service, Ivy Legal. Uh, a meeting is to be held this Friday uh, to discuss the options of that report and a way of moving forward, which we will we will feed back on very soon. Um, and it will also be discussed on how we can share the report with members uh, and how far we can share that. Uh, an update on Hayden Way on the development there. A uh, meeting was held last Thursday uh, between uh, members and the locals, and then also a site visit was carried out uh, to meet the developers. Uh, it seemed to be quite fruitful, so hopefully we can uh, improve the engagement between the public and the developer on that site. And then Bartlow Road site. Uh, this one is complicated by the fact that we're awaiting an appeal decision at the moment uh, before we can take any enforcement action. We are chasing this with the planning inspector to see how imminent this decision is. Um, so as soon as we do have more information, because obviously that decision could significantly affect uh, any action that we take. So we are chasing that. Uh, and as soon as I have any more information, obviously I'll update yourself, Chair, as uh, one of the people that we're in contact with regarding this site. And that concludes my verbal updates. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, members, any questions for Will on any enforcement cases, please? Councillor Heather Williams. I'm going to confess, I think Councillor Bradman did have a hand up before me. Sorry, I didn't see. Councillor Bradman, very honest of you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask, Will, um, there have been a number of uh, recent enforcements looking at properties in Milton and Waterbeach. Ward, I just wondered why they're not in your report. Maybe they didn't get there soon enough. Yeah, yeah. so our enforcement notices uh, are a little bit behind on how we report them uh, before you. So you'll have six more. So the ones that were all served in September will show up on the next planning committee. So these were just the ones that were served in August uh, for these enforcement notices. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Councillor Williams. Thank you. Um, just on page 213, I just want to clarify, it says it's been reallocated to Alistair, but I thought it had been reallocated from Alistair to somebody else because I think he recently got hurt or something. Um, so if I could just clarify... It's Arrington. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So if I could just clarify whether it's moved on again or whether Alistair's back in action, which I'm sure we all hope he is. Um, and the other thing was, it's just a, a thing that if we're going to have um, the tables and they go over two pages, please could we have a repeat on the headers? Because I've kind of been, um, yeah, creating my own sort of draft down here. Yeah. Thank Probably. you. 
Thank you. I think the second one's probably a printing issue for uh, democratic services officers more than anything. But uh... <laughs> yes, the second one, I, I think hopefully they can resolve <laughs> from that side. Um, but the first one, yes, uh, unfortunately, Alistair is out of action for some time. Um, but the Arrington site, obviously, there is a planning application, uh, but I have allocated the overall case into my name. In that case, I'll be in touch soon. Thank you. <laughs> I look forward to the answer. Uh, members, any further questions? Councillor Hawkins. Um, Microphone. I'm sorry. Hello, Mr. Hawkins. Um, the page 217. It's very rare to find Caldicott in your enforcement <laughs> report. What's this about? Antisocial behavior. I know, I hedge. <laughs> yes, we do not get very many of them, uh, but we do have to deal with the high hedges legislation uh, as part of our remit in planning enforcement, where members of the public pay us £450 to investigate a complaint regarding a high hedge. Um, if it meets the criteria, then we serve a notice to state at which height that hedge needs to be lowered to. Um, on this one, I can confirm that the hedge has all been fully removed um, within a week of service of the notice. So it's all sorted. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any further questions. So if you hold on, Will, we're going to move on to agenda item 13, appeals against planning decisions. Or is this you, Chris? That's me, Chair. Okay, um, you're off the hook, Will. Just one, <laughs> one comment from me. Um, Appendix 3 on page 225. Uh, Councillor Roberts asked a question last time, it hasn't been updated, I'm afraid, but the date of the hearing for Applelaker Park, London Road, Falmy, is the 6th of November. Um, no other updates from me, Chair, but happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Questions, members? No, I don't see any. So, thank you, Chris. Members, I think we're at the end. So... We've covered all the agenda items. Probably worth noting our next meeting is on Wednesday, November the 10th, uh, which will be a regular planning committee, but there's also uh, another meeting on Tuesday the 16th of November where we're solely considering um, a reserve matter application for North Stowe. Is that correct, Chris? It's three, yeah, it's an outline application for North Stowe, outline. phases 3A and 3B. Okay. Can I just note that both of those meetings will be at the Guild Hall rather than here in the Chamber due to the fire alarm and lighting upgrades currently taking place at South Camps Hall. Okay, well, so we have a new venue members for those planning to attend those two meetings. We'll be at the Guild Hall in Cambridge, so for rather an away day. Um, again, yeah, more details to follow, I think, is all to say there. Members, thank you. Wednesday the 10th of November and Tuesday the 16th of November. Can I ask what time they are? 10 a.m. Is there any chance we, because getting here after school runs and what have you is quite tricky to attend, let alone getting into the middle of Cambridge? Uh, yeah, I think Could something we can, that, I think something to decide outside of the meeting, I think, but yeah, noted we need to consider the time. Okay, members, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you everyone who's still online. Uh, we'll call the meeting to a close there and see you soon. Thank you.